All right, let's get underway. I'd like to call to order. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Madam Clerk, could you please do the roll call? Councilmember Engler? Here. Councilmember Newman? Here. Councilmember Taylor? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Here. Recording in progress. And Mayor McNamee? Here. Thank you. We have an uh, announcement here that item 7S, Library Aquarium Maintenance, is pulled and continued to January 11th. July. July 11th, thank you. And item 11A, Council on Aging Annual Report, and item 11B, Youth Commission Annual Report, will be moved up and heard after the consent calendar with all the young faces in the audience. Got to get you home for bedtime. Let's do the following. Uh, we have some special presentations, and I will move to the podium here for those presentations. We'll now begin with special presentations. I'd like to call Dusty Russell, Economic Development Analyst, to the podium for a special presentation for our Business Recognition Program and introduce our awards recipient. Dusty? Yes. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Last year, the Economic Development Division introduced a new Business Recognition Program to the community. This program is designed to highlight one exceptional Thousand Oaks business each quarter of the year for special achievements or other unique contributions made to the city relating to economic prosperity, sustainability or resilience, or other activities fostering continuous community enrichment here in Thousand Oaks. Tonight we would like to introduce and recognize our newest program award recipient. Founded in 2012, Wildflower Cases is a female-owned and operated tech accessory company located in the Rancho Conejo industrial area. What started as a creative hobby for local residents Michelle Carlson and her two daughters while the girls were still attending high school here, quickly transformed into a full-blown business after a chance encounter with celebrity Miley Cyrus. A single social media post by Cyrus about wildflower cases launched the brand's name into the pop culture stratosphere. Wildflower Cases has since become a, a globally known brand carried by retail giants including Urban Outfitters, Revolve, Free People, and Nordstrom, among hundreds of other boutique establishments worldwide. They have collaborated with some of the biggest names in fashion. They have expanded their product portfolio to include a range of other unique tech accessories, and it is not uncommon to see pop culture icons sporting the WF logo. Moreover, here at home, Wildflower Cases has grown to employ more than 50 local residents. With that said, Mayor, I'd like to invite you up to say a few things. Thank you, Dusty. At this time, I'd like to invite our awards recipient from Wildflower Cases up to accept the award. Please join me up here, if you would, please. Do we have someone from Wildflower? Come on down. As they're walking up, I'd like to thank you for taking this time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight to accept this award. Your story is an incredible one. Please come up here and join me. And let me hand to you, this to you. And your name is? Michelle. Michelle and yeah. Kevin. Your name is? Sydney. Good to meet you. You are? Devin. Devin, good to meet you. Dave. Dave, good to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. My council members and I are honored to rep that represent the city of Thousand Oaks and our wonderful, talented residents. We do our best to stage the residents so that way you can explore your passions and pursue your dreams. Tonight, we celebrate your creativity, determination, and success. We're proud to be the soil where you took your first root. We're honored to have you as part of our Thousand Oaks community, and we wish you many more years of success. Would you like to say a few words? Big hand for you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for this recognition. We, uh, you know, this company started 
from an idea from a mother as a gift for her daughters, and here we are 10, 11 years later in Thousand Oaks, employing 50 plus local residents, which we love. And, uh, and we're just thankful to be here and thankful to be recognized. So thank you, everybody. And thank you for all the support. I'd like to invite my fellow council members to join us at the dais for a photo opportunity. For our second presentation, I'd like to invite Tim Dewar and Chuck Buffer of the Canal Recreation and Parks to the podium for an annual update and talk about recognizing July as National Park and Recreation Month. Chuck, Tim, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor McNamee, members of the council and city staff. My name is Tim Dewar. I'm a Recreation Services Manager for the Canal Recreation and Park District. I'm here tonight to provide a brief update on some of the partnerships that the city and CRPD share, uh, but more importantly to say thank you for the continued support uh, that makes the relationship between our two agencies so important and special. July, as you mentioned, is Parks and Recreation Month, and the theme that they selected this year by the National Recreation and Park Association is Where Community Grows. It is evident that the collaborations our agencies have fostered through the facilities and spaces that we share is truly where our community grows. The Global Adult Center is a city-owned facility operated by CRPD that serves approximately 200,000 patrons annually and offers hundreds of enrichment classes, dozens of weekly drop-in program programs, monthly themed events, and a variety of social services designed specifically to ser serve our senior population. The partnership began, uh, was established in 1975, and the current facility opened to the public in 1991. This past year, in collaboration with the Global Senior Center Commission, Global, Senior, Global Center staff offered a variety of socially stimulating events. For example, the Veterans Day breakfast, Dodger, Dodger game viewing parties, the community garage sale, and many more themed parties like Brats and Beer, Cinco de Mayo Fiesta, and the St. Patrick's Day party, just to name a few. The Global Senior Center Commission also provides additional popular programming, including Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday Night Bingo, along with Entertainment Comes Live programs that feature quality tribute bands, guest speakers, and historical performances. A very big thank you to the City of Thousand Oaks for the financial contributions made to the recent Community Center Improvement Project. Global Center received upgraded restrooms throughout the building, a new wood floor in the main hall, new flooring in several programming rooms, and an outdoor fitness pavilion. Due to the upgraded facility and the great programming um, that was offered throughout the year, Global Center numbers are back to pre-pandemic -pan attendance. Also housed within the Global Center is the CSVP program, or the Senior, Caneo Senior Volunteer Program. Under the leadership of Julie Spivak, CSVP director, this small department has a very large impact on the community by offering a variety of service programs. Every week, Julie meets one-on-one -on -one with adults 55 and above to match them with a partner volunteer agency. CSVP has over 900 registered volunteers who serve approximately 130,000 hours per year. And of those volunteers, over 120 have served over 25,000 hours specifically with the city of Thousand Oaks. The CSVP Free Income Tax Program is in collaboration with the IRS and is available for anyone 60 years and older or anyone with an income level of 58,000 or less. The program is in its 33rd year and during the past season, 42 volunteers completed 2,146 tax returns donating over 5,000 hours and bringing over $1.4 million in refunds back to our community. 
The CSVP Senior Nutrition Program, funded by a grant through the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, is a social lunch program for seniors 60 and above. The program takes place at the Goebel Center Mondays through Fridays from 1130 to 1230, utilizes 32 volunteers serving over 2,300 hours per year and approximately 15,000 meals. The Thousand Oaks Teen Center, located next door to the Goebel Center, is the place in town for 7th to 12th graders to hang out. The facility itself opened its doors in 1989 and consists of a full-size gym, computer lab, multi-purpose rooms, a kitchen, a game room featuring pool tables, ping pong, air hockey, and the latest gaming systems. Affectionately coined the fabulous Thousand Oaks Teen Center decades ago, the facility has served hundreds of thousands of Caneo Valley teens since its opening. The collaboration is unique in which the Park District owns the land, the city owns the building, and, and provides operational funding and CRPD staffs and runs it. Teen Center Director Sarah Dobb, along with her coordinator Jay Dodwell, oversee the site, and they meet with an active Teen Center Advisory Committee once a month to stay on, stay on top of current trends and offer cool programming that draw the youth to the facility. Teen Center doors close temporarily in January of 2022 for the start of a, re of a renovation program to jazz up the interior and to start construction on what would be no become the coolest backyard in town. The project was possible with funding from the City of Thousand Oaks, the State of California, and CRPD. The exterior improvements include a 2,500-square-foot 2, skate plaza, upgraded exterior lighting, an outdoor stage, a multi-use court, a built-in barbecue and gathering areas for hanging out. Interior also received the restroom renovation with updated lighting and the floor was modernized um, along with a fully renovated kitchen that now features commercial upgrades. On March 10th, many uh, council members here were present as, as well as CVUSD school board members, CRPD board members, and State Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin as we helped celebrate the grand reopening the event was fun for all who attended and featured a free concert by national touring band Sitting on Stacy, whose band member attended Newberry Park High School and who used to participate in the Teen Center Battle of the Bands. The Caneo Unified School District also enhances this collaboration as the site is used for middle school sports leagues and hosts events such as Teen Tech Day. Nonprofit partners such as Safe Passage work to identify CVUSD students to host a free middle school two-week summer camp at the location. The Teen Center houses the Youth Outreach Program, a collaboration with CVUSD that is continuously operated for more than 40 years. Outreach staff work out of the Teen Center and meet with non-involved and hard-to-reach adolescent students to address the needs and provide support and guidance. And the Hillcrest Center for the Arts, the home for budding artists, is another example of a thriving collaboration between the city and the Park District. The facility is owned by the city and operated and funded by CRPD. The partnership agreement established in 2022 between the TO Arts and CRPD has continued to show our local youth that theater arts is strongly supported by this community. The Young Artists Ensemble had 90 local youth show up to a recent audition for the production of Into the Woods. Additionally, the collaboration has made it possible for Young Artists Ensemble performers to get the rare opportunity to perform on the big stage at the Bank of America Performing Arts Plaza. This year, they are excited to be staging the Phantom of the Opera for the annual Teen Summer Musical. And now I'm happy to introduce, introduce Chuck Huffer, Chair of our Recreation and Park District Board of Directors, who will speak more about the Park and Recreation Month of July. Thank you. Mayor McNamee, members, members of the City Council, City staff, um, as you just heard, CRPD, Canada Recreation and Park District, has a lot of partnerships that we work on together uh, as we prepare to celebrate Parks and Recreation Month, or as we prefer to call it, Recreation and Parks Month. I um, just want to say thank you again for all the support that the city has given, not just to the Park District, but to the entire community, providing buildings, supporting programs, and uh, partnering on, on parks and open space. Just as an example, uh, one of the longest partnerships is the uh, Caneo Open Space and uh, the, the, the partnership that we have uh, for open space in our community is, is probably unrivaled in, throughout the state, if not the nation. Uh, in addition, if it hadn't been for the support of the city, 
we would still be in the planning stages for a couple of our, our biggest parks, Sapway Trails and Page Lane. So thank you again for all the support that you've given us. Recreation and parks are vital to high quality of life for everyone in our community, from protecting open spaces I've talked about, to and natural resources, to help, helping to fight obesity and providing activities and resources for all people of all ages. Parks and Recreation Month encourages everyone to reflect on, on the great value that parks and recreation and professionals bring to the communities. As Kaneo Recreation and Park District continues to celebrate our 60th anniversary, or a year older than you folks, we would appreciate the foresight that our community had in 1962 that set the stage to make parks, open space, and recreation a priority in our community. We're lucky to be in a community that even as we grow, parks, open space, and recreation continues to be a priority. Through the many partnerships that we've talked about this evening with the City of Thousand Oaks, we continue to be a great place to live and play and work. We, we ask the City of Thousand Oaks to join us in celebrating parks and recreation in the month of July, uh, kicking off fairly early in the month with the fireworks show, which again is jointly supported by both the City and the Park District. So keep your eye out for lots of fun ways to join us in celebrating, including the pop-up concerts, which have, have been going on for a couple of weeks, and I hope everyone's had an opportunity to get at least to one or two of those. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Big hand for Tim and Chuck. Tim, Tim, Chuck, don't disappear just yet. I just want to say thank you for your wonderful presentation and that we are fortunate to partner with CRPD and happy to celebrate National Public Recreation Month with you. I always go out on the da dais and I speak in the city frequently and I always comment that Thousand Oaks as a city is what I refer to as the gem of California. A lot of people want to live here and it, it's a big part due to our Recreation and Parks District and the good work that is not only done today by you, but your predecessors and make this into a wonderful city that everyone enjoys. On behalf of the city, I would like to present with you a proclamation to you and would like to take a photo with you too, if it's all right with you, with our council members out here in front on the dais. So come on down, you two. You can't get away just yet. Next part, we're going to move up to Madam Clerk. You're on. This is the time and place for public comments. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Thirteen individuals have requested to speak, and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. I'd like to lay down some ground rules. I will call out the first speaker to come up, and then the next speaker who will sit behind or if they're on Zoom, just be ready that I will call you. So that way we move this along fairly quick. Also, if we hit get too long into this, I will stop at some point and have this happen at the, the, finish up the other commentators at the very end. But usually we should be able to get through this fairly quick if everyone stays on track. At 15 seconds left, I'm gonna announce so you can know to close your comments at the three minute mark, I will say 15 seconds. So that way you know to start bringing your comments to close. And at three minutes, I will say thank you very much. Please step away and I'll call up the next speaker. Everyone clear? Excellent. So the first up we have 
for public comment is here in house is Darren Jeffrey. And then Darren, after you, we have Mike Hauser. Mike, would you please come on down and have a seat behind uh, Jeffrey? Jeffrey, you've got three minutes. Feel free to begin. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, and city staff. My name is Darren Jeffrey. I am the Deputy Library Services Director for the city. I just wanted to take a few seconds to let the Thousand Oaks community know that the Grant R. Brimhall Library is hosting a community focus group on Wednesday, July 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Marvin E. Smith Community Room. This focus group will provide an opportunity for participants to share their thoughts about possible updates to the city's library buildings and services. The focus group will be conducted by the architecture firm of Johnson Favreau, which the city has hired to create both the space plan and library master plan that will serve as a blueprint for library services and facilities for many years to come. So again, please feel free everyone to welcome, to join us Wednesday, July 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Marvin E. Smith community room so your thoughts can be heard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up, we have Mike Hauser, and then after that on Zoom, we have Karen Wilburn. Mike, please go ahead and begin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Mike Hauser, I'm your transit program manager, and I'm happy to report that the 2023 Summer Beach Bus Program is now in operation. This program runs Monday through, th through Friday, now through August the 11th, except for July the 4th, and we provide two round trips daily uh, between the Borchard Community Center and the Teen Center uh, to Zuma Beach in Malibu. Best part is the cost, round trip cost is only $4 or $1 if you are a senior 65 and older or have a disability and new this year, uh, if you are a student in grades one through 12 or if you are a, co a local college student with a current ID, you ride completely for free. Uh, so if you'd like more information about the program, uh, please visit our website. The Thousand Oaks Transit website is www.totransit, all one word, dot org. Thank you. Mike, thank you. And uh, on report from one of our council members, the bus was full today going out to the beach. So I'm glad we're using it. Thank you, sir. Next up on Zoom, we have Karen Wilburn. And then after that would be Christy Warner, who's here in house. Christy, come on down. And after Karen's through, we'll have you speak. Karen, you're on. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Karen Wilburn from Newberry Park. In November of 2021, I spoke about transparency during public meetings, and the council took my concerns to heart. In view of the new council, I would like to make this request again. All members of the public have a right to speak and express their opinions. However, the public and council also have the right to know if any speakers may have a conflict of interest. Therefore, I ask that speakers should be required to disclose any conflict of interest. This would apply to anyone who would benefit financially or has financial ties to a developer or business who has an item on the agenda. This should include realtors, PR firms, chamber members, family members, and employees of developers and businesses. Normal citizens are usually pretty open about their motivations to speak, but those who have other motives are not always so easy to spot. I hope this council will continue to ask speakers to disclose any potential connections or conflicts. Let's keep transparency in our city on both sides of the dais. Thank you. Next up, we have Christy Warner, and after Christy, Norby Gregory. Gregory, Nor Norby, would you please come down and have a seat behind? And uh, we have Christy, you're on. Three minutes, go ahead. Good evening, Mayor McNamee, council members, and viewing audience. My name is Emily, and I'm the president of K-Kids. This is Christy Warner. She's a member of the Thousand Oaks Kiwanis Club, intervention teacher, advisor to Westlake High School Key Club, and the K-Kids Service Leadership Program at Weathersfield Elementary. She is also a Relay for Life volunteer. We are, too. We have some members that would like to share some important information about our 2023 Conejo Valley Relay for Life on September 30th, 2023. Hello, my name is Piper and I am a member of K-Kids. 
The Amer American Cancer Society Relay for Life is a life-changing event that gives everybody in our community and those across the world a chance to celebrate the lives of people who have battled cancer, remember loved ones lost, and fight a back against the diseases. The American Cancer Society is the largest private source of cancer research funding in the United States. The funds raised through Relay for Life will help find better treatments and lead scientists closer to a cure, as well as provide many educational support and early detection programs and services to our community. Hi, my name is Tristan, and I am team captain for Kiwanis Cares. Please join us for... for Conejo Valley Relay for Life Rock the Cure at 9 a.m. September 30th, 2023 until 9 p.m. at CLU Memorial Stadium. Please join our team Kiwanis Cares or start your own. Bring your friends and family to walk to support those who have survived and honor those who have lost the fight or are still fighting. Kiwanis Club of Thousand Oaks will be providing a pancake and sausage breakfast starting at 8 o'clock for all registered participants. Go to our website, relayforlife.org slash Conejo Valley CA to register. We'll have opening ceremonies at 9 a.m. with city officials sharing a few words of encouragement. We know our time's up. Can we keep going? Okay. Hello. Hello. My name is Marlon, and I am a member of Builders Club. Survivors will then take the opening lap with the community and cheering them on. Team supports will then take to the track and walk until the lumin luminaria at 8 p.m. This is where we pay tribute to those lost to cancer, as well as celebrate those that have survived. We will have a speaker then walk the track silence. The event ends at closing ceremonies. The teams and team and words. The, and team words. Okay. Hello, my name is Grace and I'm a member of Westlake High School Key Club. So for this event, teams will have on-site fundraising with raffle and silent auction items. We'll also have live entertainment by local musicians and food for purchase. Luminaria bags which line the track will be available the day of as well as online on our website. Survivors will be served a special dinner at 6 p.m. donated by a local restaurant. Join us as we celebrate survivors, raise funds, and make new friends. Thousand Oaks City Council, we relay mm. on you. We relay on <laughs> you. Christy, 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 before you go, it is incredibly difficult and one of the greatest fears people have standing up in front of an audience and making a speech. Your crew, ladies, gentlemen, you did great. Congratulations, big hand for them. Thank you. Next up we have Norby, actually Norby Gregory, yes. and then after that, George Senko. George, come on down and we'll go from there. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. I was actually here to just gift my time to my beautiful Kiwanin kids, and I think they did a fabulous job. But we really would like to see you on September 30th for Relay for Life. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> just as a thought, one of the two top reasons why people pass on is through heart disease and cancer, and there isn't a family out here who hasn't been touched by the tragedy of cancer affecting someone's health. So thank you for doing this. Next up, we have George Senko, and after George, we have Gregory Rosenthal. Go ahead. George Rosenthal. <laughs> George Senko, and then George Rosenthal, correct? Okay, if I misspoke. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilman, City Attorney, City Manager, staff, and fellow citizens. It has now been eight weeks since we brought to your attention that the owner of the Rant Senior Mobile Home Park had taken steps to usurp your ability to manage land use within our city. The clock is ticking. 
Our anxiety is growing. All of our parks are at risk for this type of action. We have provided you with the fruits of our research that indicate that a senior overlay ordinance is a proper and just exercise of your powers. Other cities have en enacted such an ordinance, and the courts have said that you have the power and authority to issue such restrictions. Other cities have also imposed moratoriums to give them time to create their ordinances. Correspondence and a meeting with the city staff has indicated that it will take time to create such an ordinance. In the meantime, an immediate moratorium should be enacted so that the ranch is not reclassified as a family park in September. You have two meetings before you go on vacation. You will not be back until September. If you do not impose such a moratorium in lieu of an immediate overlay ordinance, you are in fact taking 74 mobile homes out of the senior affordability inventory. I have provided you with today's front page LA Times article which is, highlights the problem of seniors being priced out of a housing else. Elsewhere you are spending millions of dollars to address the homeless and affordability situations. This protection will cost the city no additional out-of-pocket dollars. You have listed as the city's top two goals addressing homelessness and affordable housing. If that is true, please do not sit on the dais and do nothing. We elected you to responsibly manage the city assets. Our senior mobile home parks are a valuable asset of the city of Thousand Oaks that should be seen as such by you. We ask that you direct the city staff to do whatever it takes to allow you to put an immediate moratorium in place before you go on vacation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up, we have George Rosenthal. And after George, we have Kevin Snyder. Kevin, come on down and have a seat behind. You'll be called up shortly. George, you're on. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Council, and staff, my name is George Rosenthal, and I represent hundreds of mobile home owners in the Ventu Estates Villa Parks. It was brought to our attention several months ago that the new owner of the Ranch Senior Mobile Home Park was changing the designation from senior to family. Changing to a family park is untenable for seniors in many ways. One is parking. Two is noise and congestion. Three, mainly, is the loss of available, affordable housing for new owners. Ventu Estates Villas has 25 new homeowners in the past year. If those 25 senior homeowners had to bid against families with multiple incomes compared to single Social Security incomes, there would have been a great loss of affordable housing for Thousand Oaks seniors. Representatives of our various parks have met with the zoning board asking for an overlay of the current zoning ordinance which would stop the change in the zoning. This type of overlay has already been approved by California courts covering many cities. We are asking the council to immediately pass a moratorium to stop the action moving forward by the ranch park to a family park. Why would the moratorium be needed now? It is critical to act now because the new ranch owners have stated that in writing that the change will take place September 1st. There are only two more council meetings until the summer break, which will last beyond the September 1st deadline please pass a moratorium to stop the action moving forward. Thank you. Next up, we have Kevin Snyder. And after Kevin, we have Carol Partington. Carol, come on down and have a seat right behind. Your on, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Thousand Oaks City Council. Uh, my name is Kevin Snyder, and uh, my family owns and operates the Hillcrest Royale Retirement Community which has served the city of Thousand Oaks since 1989. Um, the existence of a homeless encampment uh, directly adjacent to our facility 
has raised concerns for our senior residents. The, the encampment has resulted in an increased sense of insecurity amongst our senior community. Many of our elderly residents, as well as our younger staff members, have reported feeling fearful, particularly when venturing outside of their homes or walking to their vehicles. Instances of harassment and theft have been reported, leading to a significant decline in the overall feeling of safety within the area. We have asked the police on numerous occasions for their help in addressing this problem, and each and every time we have been met with some variation of, we'll do what we can, but our hands are tied. The next morning, the encampment is gone, only to reappear literally by mid-afternoon. The unsanitary conditions of the encampment pose a significant health risk for both the homeless individuals and the surrounding community. Improper waste disposal, lack of access to clean water, and inadequate sanitation facilities create an environment conducive to the spread of disease and pests. This situation poses a particular threat to the vulnerable senior population who may already have compromised immune systems. The presence of the encampment has also limited the accessibility and use of public spaces and the amenities for our senior residents. These areas serve as essential gathering places and recreational spots for our elderly community, providing opportunities for socialization, physical exercise, and mental well-being. The current situation denies our seniors the full enjoyment of these vital resources. I understand the, that addressing homelessness is a complex issue requiring long-term solutions. However, I kindly ask the Thousand Oaks City Council and take whatever action necessary within its considerable power to mitigate the negative impact of the encampment on our senior community. I believe that together we can ensure that Thousand Oaks remains a welcoming and supportive place for all of its residents. Thank you. Next up we have Carol Partington and after that Brian Scott. Brian come on down and have a seat behind. Carol you're on. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Carol Partington from Newberry Park. I'm here to ask the council to consider the timing of significant decisions facing you. Finalizing a general plan, remapping the area for better community representation, and considering a zoning change of which much work has happened just before the spring break gives the impression of rushing and these decisions have significant impact on our community's future. As expressed in formalizing a general plan, affirmative housing is critical. Please allow local agencies to assist in collaborating on true plans and bringing affordable options here for low to middle income individuals. The Borchard property rezoning consideration as acknowledged in the ACORN newspaper for the past two weeks is a tense situation. And the proposed development design offers food and fun Yet this property could better serve its community of Thousand Oaks and Newberry Park if more care and consideration is given to this plot of land. There seems to be a rush for a move on this property rather than dedicated time to consider options. Sorry, but based on the presented plan for mixed use, a boutique hotel with rooftop dining and a town square retail, site, a retail shops as cited Pacific Palisades Village hardly aligns with the proposed general plan where affordable housing is one of your top priorities. Already approved changes of the nearby area of Newberry Park have impacted streets, especially the Wendy and Borchard off-ramps. Please do not look at each of these developments in a vacuum. I respectfully request that the City Council ask for a combined study of the cumulative effect of these approved changes before consideration is given to changing the land use for the Borchard property. Please have the Borchard property discussion set back to the staff for further study, discussion, and be placed as a future separate agenda. Thank you for asking for input on issues about our community. I have submitted districting maps, and I will be there for Saturday's review. Lastly, I now ask community residents, signing a petition that the majority of us did about the Borchard property shows your concerns, and now walk the talk. Get involved, write letters and emails to the editor of local papers. Also write letters and emails to the Congress people expressing your concerns and expectations. 
get involved with these public meetings. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Brian Scott. Brian coming up to the podium. After Brian, we have Patrick Hoismer, Ho Hoismeyer. Patrick, or Patricia, come on down and uh, have a seat. Sir, you're on. Brian, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Councilman and Mayor. Yo, Mayor, you made a comment about what a great place Thousand Oaks is to live. You know, there are a lot of senior citizens that have lived here their entire life and now are in jeopardy of not having a place to live because there isn't low income. Are you aware of that? I'm here to support the senior overlay. Other, st other counties have uh, adopted this. You can do it too. It's not out of your wheelhouse. Uh, city of uh, Ventura, City of Santa Barbara, City of uh, Ucaipa, City of uh, Huntington Beach, City of uh, uh, Campestrano, and others have adopted this. You know, there's a game plan on how to, o there's a game book on how to overthrow a, 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 a government. The people at the, that own this trailer park, they have a game plan and they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to make it very difficult for the people that live there, including myself. They want anybody that's in a trailer over 25 years, they want to get rid of us. They want to be able to bring in new trailers so they can jack up the rate. If you're in, a, in the park and you die, and your family is in another state and they don't want to deal with it, they're not going to make it easy for you. They're going to say, hey, it can't be sold. We'll buy it. You have to haul it out. They don't buy it. Somebody comes in and buys it. They don't have to pay to haul it out. The other people haul it out. It's already happened in the park. They want you to let them own that property, get rid of that trailer, and they're going to bring in another trailer and they're going to charge higher rent. And they're methodically going about this to get people out of the park. You pay on time, they're going to send you a three and 60 day notice. You either pay up in three days or you're out in 60 days. Even though you've paid, this has been going on for several months. You people have the power. Now, the majority of you people, is this your primary job? Probably not. Most of you, it's your secondary job. What happens when this job is, your primary job is gone, and now you're no longer on this level, and uh, you want to downsize? There's not going to be any place in Thousand Oaks for you to go. And I'll bet you, and if you're lucky, at that point in time, if the city council has a backbone, then you'll be lucky, because they'll be on your side. 15 seconds. We have no evidence that you people are ready to work with us or cooperate with us. I've lived here since 62. I bet I've lived here longer than any one of you people. 2008 wasn't my fault. Thank you, sir. But Next it affected up, we have Patricia. Done. Thanks, guys. Hoistmeyer. Patricia, you're up. And after Patricia, we have Sandy G. Sandy, come on down. You're next up after that. Go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead and begin when you're ready. Sorry. Take your time setting up. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'm Pat Hostmeyer. I live in the ranch, and you're probably sick and tired of seeing me. I'm, this is my fourth time here. <clears throat> I have also sent an email, and I would like to say thank you very much to Bob Engler for responding to that email. I appreciate it. Um, I, I was a manager for a mobile home parks for 20 years. Um, first park I had was a family park, 320 spaces. And the other three that I had, two of them here and uh, one of them in, um, wait, two in, in Santa Clarita, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and then we came here. Um, there's such a difference in the environment between a family park and a senior park. The ranch, I, I think I suggested one time when I was here that maybe you all take a little ride over to the ranch and check it out. It, it, it's ridiculous <laughs> when, when you think of families being in this park. There's, little, there's probably 60% 
single wide homes in there. And there's absolutely nothing for a child to do. Uh, a teenager, I can't even imagine a teenager in there wanting to have his friends, no place to go. I'm just trying to be realistic, having lived and managed in one park that was, was a family, other parks that are seniors, and it, it is totally a different environment. And we all really have a lot of respect for all of you, and we hope that you'll give us a consideration of uh, giving us this moratorium that we need, and um, I thank you very much for your time. Next up, we have Sandy G. Sandy, you're next up. And th that's okay, take your time. And after that, we have Danielle Borgia. Danielle, come on down and have a seat behind. Sandy, proceed when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Mayor McNamee and City Council. Um, I am also here, uh, my name's Sandy Gill. I live in the ranch mobile home park. I am also here to, I don't know if we even have time to get put on the agenda at this point before your all's summer break, but I am asking you to please do a moratorium as George requested um, so that the current owners of our park cannot turn us into a family park on September 1st. Um, as Brian also mentioned, the three and 60 letters that some of our residents have received for no valid reason. Three of these people are in their 90s and they're being threatened with eviction even though they have made their payments. Um, but they, we <laughs> have it on good report that there is a list apparently of people that their payments are not to be processed. Take that for what you will and I hope that this will also encourage you to help us by doing the overlay, the district overlay and doing an immediate moratorium to stop this thing from happening. Because we're all suffering, our anxiety is definitely raising, um, especially for these poor people who've been given these threatening letters. Uh, it's just wrong, it's just wrong. Thank you very much for your time. Next up we have Danielle Borgia of our Caneo Valley Chamber of Commerce, the CEO, welcome. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and council members. Um, just here for our monthly chamber report um, on some of the activities. But first, I wanted to make a special introduction of our new Director of Government Affairs and Tourism, Mr. Josh Gray. Um, he is a resident of Ventura County. He most recently held a role at Penny Mac um, as their Manager of External Affairs and Government Affairs. And he has a broad background, um, spent some time in DC, um, in the White House, and also with some uh, different business organizations as well. Um, we recently held our recognition gala at the Moore Park Zoo last uh, month on May 19th. We had the opportunity to honor um, Al Adam as our man of the year and a number of deserving businesses and individuals. We held our Mixpo last Wednesday at the Gardens at Los Robles Greens. We had over 40 businesses that participate in that event and over 200 attendees. We are going to be hosting our 40 under 40 um, reception next month and our honoree list should be uh, public by the end of the week, but I did want to just give a special shout out to um, City of Thousand Oaks employee Justine Kendall, who is one of our honorees this year. And we have our applications open for Leadership Conejo for 2023-2024. Um, we just wrapped up our graduating class this past May. And we have a grand opening celebration for Amy's drive through next week. And I just pointed out because it's their first location in Southern California. Um, Heather just did a walkthrough today and she said the space is beautiful. So we are very much looking forward to welcoming them to our business community. And then on the tourism side, we recently partnered with Wild Oaks Country Music Festival on their event on June 2nd um, with the Westlake Rotary. We brought in Peter Weber, who is an influencer from um, this local area. He has over 1.4 million followers. We sent him to Boot Barn to get geared up for the festival, and so his reel um, had over 240,000 um, views on his social media over that weekend. 
We are also working on an X Game micro campaign um, with the X Games coming to Ventura to really capitalize on our proximity with um, the expected crowds for that event. We have a custom landing page. We are bringing in a couple of um, influencers on the skateboarder side um, ahead of the games at the end of June. We have a paid email campaign that we've sent through Visit California with over 200,000 contacts as well as a paid email list with over 12,500 um, Targeted contacts, um, we're doing a local um, a giveaway and then highlighting different activities in the local area that we think would be attracted to um, people that might attend the X Games. And that is my report, thank you. Josh, uh, would you like to say a few words? You've got 12 seconds, make it quick. I'm excited to uh, be able to report uh, on a regular basis about business activities. Please use me as a resource. I'm happy to talk to anybody and everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to City Manager Drew Powers to comment. Mr. Powers? Yeah, just a couple of quick follow-up comments. Um, um, to um, uh, a gentleman that spoke from Hillcrest Royale, I know our Chief of Police and our Assistant City Manager, they're gonna catch you in the lobby to talk in a little more detail. Uh, the area you spoke of is something we're very familiar with, unfortunately, and something that we're dealing with on an almost daily basis, but uh, they'll be happy to step out and talk about um, other opportunities there. Um, there was some comments about the general plan. I just wanna make sure there's clarity. Um, the council is not uh, taking action on the general plan prior to recess. The general plan consideration is not until December of this year, uh, and it will have to go through planning commission first. What the council is doing is having a study session, um, uh, which uh, coincides with um, the uh, uh, public uh, community meeting on the topic and our uh, GPAC, our general plan advisory committee, that is uh, all getting together, all culminating to the release of the environmental document on the general plan, which will be in August. So a lot of steps to go before council is considering the general plan. Um, there was also comment about the uh, Voting Rights Act being rushed, uh, the consideration of the maps, just as a reminder, I know council's aware of this, but for the public, um, these processes have a uh, fuse attached to them uh, in order to avoid um, uh, legal implications and uh, uh, they have to be completed within a, um, a uh, tight timeline. And that timeline for us means we have to have consideration uh, uh, finalized by the 18th of July. Uh, so that's why that is on that timeline. That's all prescribed uh, by, uh, uh, in statute by the state. Um, and then finally on mobile home park issues, um, as some of the residents know, the, we're having our general plan um, study session at the next meeting. Uh, and one of the areas that's covered within the general plan from a land use perspective is mobile homes. Uh, and there'll be an opportunity for the council to discuss that and provide direction uh, accordingly coming out of uh, that discussion. That's it. Thank you, sir. Next up, we have the consent calendar. I'm gonna ask council members, do you have any questions for staff, any items you wish to pool? Very good. So we have one speaker for con uh, consent calendar. I would like to call up Wes Myers. Wes, come on up. Wes, you'll have three minutes and Begin when you're ready. Testing. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, my name is Wes Myers. Thank you for hearing my comments. Regarding item uh, consent item 7E, I'm speaking on behalf of the Rolling Oaks Property Owners Association. We are the unincorporated community neighboring the proposed project on 400 East Rolling Oaks Drive. Um, none of us voted for you, but we would have because we're unincorporated. Do jokes count towards the time? <laughs> so although we're not within the city limits, we're grateful for planning staff for their outreach and communication on the proposed project. We've read the amended contract scope with DUDEC and appreciate the detail everyone spent to ensure the accuracy on the EIR. We agree that the scope as amended is likely appropriate to represent the interests of the city. However, we believe more work is needed to ensure DUDEC properly analyzes those impacts to adjacent communities, such as ours, which are not within the city limits. Just as the county has an interest in those developments within the city, the same can be said for the opposite because we all share this beautiful valley together. I will not go into details now because it's not the appropriate venue, but I would like to highlight how inserting additional sentence here or there can drastically change the analysis of this proposed project. For example, the current wording on the contract scope as proposed amended 
is, quote, under land use and planning, this discussion will analyze the relationship of the proposed project and associated entitlements to applicable planning policies and ordinances included in the city's general plan and municipal code. The project's potential to divide an established community will also be analyzed as well as the potential compatibility conflicts with adjacent uses. This is appropriate language to show compatibility with the city's policies. It even addresses adjacent uses. However, it does not address multi-jurisdictional zoning of this area, nor the fact that the county has its own policies and overlay zones, each with, dis each with distinct purposes that might be in serious conflict with this proposal. Admittingly, this proposed project is entirely within the city limits and therefore entirely subject to the city policies and procedures. However, to understand the true impact of this proposal as required by CEQA, analysis cannot happen in a vacuum and we believe that additional language is still necessary on this scope and required to properly represent those impacts to an area, to the whole area, regardless of where the city limit boundaries are. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Myers, I can honestly say that's the first time I've heard anyone come up to and be, provide comment who said, I voted for none of you. <laughs> With that, uh, any um, kind of a motion from council to move forward on the consent calendar? I would move to move forward uh, with the consent calendar in total. With that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Engler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you. We're going to move to items 11A and B, which have moved up on our agenda. I'd like to call up Patricia. Loans, Lowes, Lowns, if I'm close, uh, Chair of Council of Aging and the Annual Report. Karen Sylvester, Vice Chair of Council on Aging as well. Look forward to your report. Please step up and look forward to your presentation. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and Council members. My name is Patty Lowns. I am the chair of the Council on Aging. It's been a pleasure to be here this evening and to present to you the 2022-23 Council on Aging Annual Report. We had a challenging but very exciting year. Our monthly meetings are an opportunity to build and deepen relationships, not only with our older adult community, but within the Council itself and as well to learn about projects and provide feedback from an older adult perspective. As you see on the screen, we had a range of knowledgeable speakers. Topics included everything from housing to the city budget process. At this time, I'd like to introduce Vice Chair Karen Sylvester to provide the next part of our presentation. Thank you, Patty. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I just want to go over a couple of highlights for the past year. Uh, first of all, in an effort to increase participation and engagement of older adults within Thousand Oaks, uh, the Council on Aging moved our monthly meetings to the Global Center. Additionally, as you all know, because you were here, the city proclaimed the month of May as Older Americans Month, recognizing that older adults play a key role in the vitality of our neighborhoods, networks, and lives. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, throughout the year, commissioners sought to be engaged in the community and make a difference through their work on five different committees. First, the Communications Committee worked to increase awareness of the Council on Aging within the community through revamping flyers as well as social media content. A promotional video is forthcoming. The Commissioner Guide Ad Hoc Committee compiled a user-friendly binder to serve as a commissioner handbook. This will be a welcome resource for new commissioners as they onboard in the upcoming year. The 2023 Wellness Festival was a great success. It took place at the Global Center on January 18, 2023, and it had over 400 participants. 
the Council on Aging hosted a booth, you can see in the picture. Uh, we handed out swag and provided much information. The Wellness Festival is a key event which connects older adults to much needed resources. The Mobile Home Outreach Committee worked to connect residents, primarily older adults, living in mobile home parks to available resources, including food and housing assistance, as well as low-cost internet and other services. The committee met with mobile home park representatives, as well as community service provided, providers, and created a very comprehensive food pantry resource brochure. Finally, the Council on Aging also sponsored three events in support of the One City, One Book program. The book, Remarkably Bright Creatures, by Shelby Van Pelt, portrays a wooded, widowed woman who finds understanding and connection with a clever octopus in ways that were both surprising and somewhat relatable. The events we sponsored highlighted the book's themes of aging, older adult employment, grief, and reminiscence. Each event offered participants an opportunity to not only reflect on the book, but as well, again, to connect with older adult resources that are available in our community. I will now hand this back to Patty to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Karen. Commissioners deepened relationships across the community as well as provided updates and information with organizations through serving as a liaison. The liaison positions are listed on the screen and included a wide range of organizations addressing older adult issues throughout the community. A summary of each commissioner's experience is included as attachment one of the staff report. It's been a wonderful year. In program year 2023-24, we will seek direction from the city manager's office on potential projects for the Council on Aging and activities that support our duties. As we conclude our presentation, we want to thank you again for having us tonight. I also want to thank and acknowledge Sarah Mails for all the support she's provided to the Council on Aging over the year. It hasn't been an easy job, I am here to tell you. Um, and I also want to thank my co-chair. Um, I have thousands of kicks in the shins um, to prove it. Um, <laughs> And so, in conclusion, Community Service Analyst Sarah Mails, Vice Chair Karen Sylvester, and I are available for your questions. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And Gail, excuse me, I forgot another support mechanism, Gail Janelle, who's one of our commissioners. Thank you for the presentation and your effort that you provide to Thousand Oaks. I wasn't aware, Sarah, you had such a difficult group to work with. Congratulations. <laughs> we can be a handful sometimes. <laughs> With that, I'd like to open up to um, questions for council. Any questions? Terrific. We were so, that perfect, huh? You are yeah. excellent. You're spot Love on, it. perfect in every way. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask for a motion from my council members to accept the report? And, And this is an action not covered by CEQA. I hope to get rid of that dialogue at some point, but that's going through the courts. Mr. Uh, Newman. So moved. That was easy for you. Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler. Yes. Council Member Newman. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. And Mayor McNamee. Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Next up, we have the Youth Commission Annual Report. I don't know if they are as challenging as the previous group, but we'll see. We have Lindsay Friedman, Chair of Youth Commission, Benjamin Globke, Commissioner, Youth Commission, and available for questions, uh, Sarah Mills, Community Service Analyst. Feel free to proceed. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and Council Members. It is our pleasure to be here this evening to present the 2022-23 Youth Commission Annual Report. My name is Lindsay Friedman, and it was an absolute honor to serve as the Youth, Youth Commission Chair this past year. I have been on the commission for four years, and I just finished up my junior year at Newbury Park High School. 
We had an exciting year full of growth and opportunity. Each month during our meetings, we interacted with knowledgeable guest speakers that provided the Commission's opportunities to build relationships and review and provide input on matters pertaining to youth. Topics included everything from city communications, economic development, homelessness, to sustainability. Uh, good evening, Mayor McNamee and Council Members. My name is Benjamin Glopke, and I've been on the Youth Commission for two years. And this fall, I will be going into my junior year at Thousand Oaks High School. So the Youth, Commission, uh, the youth Commissioners provided outreach to the youth by uh, creating three committees this year. The first one uh, you can see on the TV uh, is the Environmental Committee. So this year we planned and hosted a youth trash cleanup on Saturday, April 29th. Uh, we had 27 students and five adults participate in this beautification project, which took place along Moore Park Road in between Avenida de los Flores and Lancer Way. Uh, the event cleared dead organic matter and trash from the side of the road to help clear the area for stormwater runoff uh, to prevent fires and reduce pollution. Uh, this spring, or sorry, this is the uh, Spreading Arts Awareness Committee. We planned and hosted an interactive art booth at the City of Thousand Oaks uh, Arbor Earth Day celebration on April 15th, 2023. The commission provided recycled materials and facilitated an activity where attendees created vision boards. The theme was mental health in the environment, envisioning a future that we could uh, aspire towards. Uh, not pictured is the College Advisory Committee. Uh, the committee is working to create additional or an ad informational brochure that will summarize college preparation information and provide linkage to applicable resources available in the community. Uh, a summary of commissioner experiences in is included as attachment one to the staff report. Youth commissioners also deepen relationships across the community and provided updates and information with organizations by serving as liaisons to four groups. These groups included the City of Thousand Oaks Library, the Alex Fiore Teen Center, Associated Student Body and Associated Student Government on school campuses, and Conejo Valley Unified School District Advisory Council. I will now hand the presentation back to Lindsay. As part of our liaison relationships with the Teen Center, we supported the grand reopening of the Alex Fiore Teen Center back in March. Commissioners provided elected officials with tours of the renovated building as well as the backyard. And of course, we stayed to enjoy the concert. It's been a wonderful year. In 2023-24, we will be seeking direction from the city manager's office on potential projects, such as hosting the biannual Youth Leadership Summit and providing outreach to relevant youth agencies or activities that support the duties of the Youth Commission. Additionally, we would like to give a big thank you to Sarah Mails for all the help. We would not be able to accomplish any of this without her outstanding support. And this concludes our presentation this evening. Community services and analysts, Sarah Mails, the commissioners, and I are available for any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I, I'd like to ask uh, Council Member Mikey Taylor if the, I don't know, skateboard park is now made out of marble? Is there any uh, movement in that direction? There sir? hasn't been any movement yet on the Marble City, unfortunately. Uh, but for everyone in social media world, we're working on it. <laughs> Excellent. And Sarah, between the Youth Commission and the Council on Aging, would you agree that there's different energy and personality to both those groups? Oh, 100%. And they're both excellent. <laughs> well stated, very politically answered. Thank you very much. <laughs> Council, any questions you have for the Youth Commission? I'd like to say thank you very much for your service. Those lists of projects that you have worked on take a lot of organization, teamwork, and beautifies the city. Thank you very much for your effort here. A big hand for all everyone that participated. Thank you. We need a motion to accept the report. Council members, I, 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 I can feel it. Mr. Newman, no, I felt Mr. Newman over here. I could see he was ready to do it. Mr. Newman, you want to make a motion? He yields to Mr. Engler. I'd be happy to make the motion that we accept their report and uh, that this is not a uh, item that is uh, CEQA impact. Excellent. Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that item passes five to zero. Mr. Adam, I'll come to you next time for the motion. Thank you, they beat you to the punch. City Clerk, would you please open up the hearing for 8A, transition to district elections, hearing number three. 
Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item number 8A, transition to district elections, hearing number three, district boundary maps and sequencing of elections. Speakers are requested to state their name for the record. 13 individuals have presented speaker cards and pursuant to council standards, each speaker will have three minutes. Thank you, and from city staff we have city, uh, Assistant City Attorney David Womack, actually Dave Womack, do you prefer Dave or David? Dave is fine. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Sydney Overly, uh, business analyst, and Mr. Doug Johnson, president of National Democratic Corporation. Sir, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and mem members of council. Uh, tonight is hearing number, public hearing number three out of the statutorily required four public hearings. Uh, as the uh, prior hearings, we were t discussing the composition of districts, how to go about doing that. Uh, tonight we get down to uh, the nitty-gritty and we start looking at uh, some of the draft maps that were submitted, uh, including the draft maps that were submitted by our demographer, who is with us tonight, Mr. Doug Douglas Johnson. Uh, tonight we're going to start off by uh, turning the matter over to, or hearing, or this part of our presentation over to our uh, retained consultant in uh, the uh, public outreach um, at uh, Trepepe Smith. So if they are online, do we have them? Yes, I'm here. Can okay, you hear me? Great. Yep, we do. So if Perfect. you'll just let me know when you're ready to move to the next slide. I'm ready. Okay. Go ahead, it's all you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. Thank you again for having me tonight. My name is Sydney and I'm with Trepepe Smith. I'd like to share a few updates related to our outreach efforts since the last public hearing. The districting website, maptox.org, continues to house all the information and updates related to this process. We continue to post all the draft maps, public comments, and meeting materials for the public to review. We've distributed two more press releases since the last public hearing to provide information about the mapping tools in upcoming meetings, as well as encourage residents to provide feedback on draft maps submitted. We continue to work with the city to engage with residents on social media through posts, stories, and event reminders across all platforms. The content is available in both English and Spanish. We continue to contact community leaders, organizations, and residents by phone and email to keep them informed about upcoming public meetings and key deadlines in this process. We've been collecting all the feedback received so far and have posted it on the website as public comment. We've also created and distributed four flyers in English and Spanish to promote the upcoming community meetings. We have one more planned flyer for the fourth public hearing. So far, we've hosted two community workshops to help educate the community on the process and gather input on communities of interest. We have two more workshops planned for this week to review draft maps and collect community feedback on any focus maps council may identify tonight. We will also be hosting an informational pop-up booth at the Pop-Up Arts and Music Festival on June 23rd, and residents will be able to provide feedback directly to us there as well. Our outreach efforts will continue throughout um, until the end of this process. Um, if there's any questions about outreach, I'd be happy to answer that now. If not, I'll turn it over to Doug to get into the draft maps. All right, we'll move forward with the uh, next part of our presentation. Thank you, and, and again, I'm Doug Johnson from NDC. It's good to be with you again. Um, most people at this point are familiar with the schedule, thankfully, but I'll just briefly touch on it. We did start, as the state requires, with um, initial hearings, which were to inform the public of the process going on, the rules and process, and how they can participate and draw maps. And now we get to kind of the meat of the process, where we have a whole bunch of maps, and, we're, and I'm happy to say that the outreach effort you just heard about did generate a, a, a very happily wide variety of maps for the public comment on tonight and for council to consider. I will touch on one of the goals tonight, just to foreshadow uh, later on, is to uh, select two to four focus maps. The idea, just to touch on in a big picture, is we have a lot of maps and it's a lot for residents to go over. If we try to do a community forum with all these maps, it's just too much to process. And so if we can narrow that list down tonight, That'll help us focus the upcoming community forums on the maps that are of most of interest to the residents and the council. This is not a binding decision. It's more just a where's the mindset at as we sit here today. 
And it's certainly open to change if we do get a lot of feedback on a map that's not in the focus maps. What typically happens is we'll pick two to four focus maps, maybe ask for a couple of uh, variations on those, and residents will listen to what happens tonight and submit more maps. So even though we pick two to four, we'll probably be back at eight to 10 by the time we come back to the next hearing, which is another reason to narrow it down tonight. So as I mentioned, and as you just heard, there is outreach going on actually later this week. Um, and then we come back in uh, July, after the 4th of July break, um, for selection of the preferred map. And uh, if all goes well, introduction of the ordinance. And then we come back at, in late July and with second reading of that ordinance, which is the final step in the process. Tonight's main goal is to go through the maps and get public input and council direction on them. And so it's important to keep in mind the statutory and traditional rules governing how these maps are drawn and how uh, they are picked. So uh, these have been covered at the earlier hearings and in the community forum, so I'll go through them fairly quickly. But first we have in the far left the federal laws, which is a very strict equal population requirement. We have to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which means don't divide up any uh, neighborhoods that are heavily one protected class or another. And no racial gerrymandering. So race can be a factor, but it cannot be what the court calls the predominant factor. Sometimes there's confusion over this because the California Voting Rights Act, of course, is very heavily weighted on weight, uh, on race, sorry. And so that, the difference is, is that the decision to go to districts under the California Voting Rights Act is driven almost entirely by race. But the map that you pick of districts cannot be so heavily weighted on race. It has to be weighted on other factors, like, uh, the, like the California criteria. So that's the key thing of avoiding race being the predominant factor. Then the state has its criteria, and these are in prioritized order. So first, contiguous. You know, there can't be separate pieces of the, of the uh, district in different parts of the city. Second, as much as possible, we have to have undivided neighborhoods and communities of interest. And a community of interest is either a, a city policy impacts a group in a certain way, or they share socioeconomic um, characteristics in, a, in given geographic areas that would mean they benefit from being kept together in a district. Similarly, we want the boundaries to be easily identifiable, so freeways, highways, you know, rivers, that kind of thing, just so it's easier for the voters to know where their boundaries are. And then compact. And I'll come back to this one again as we talk through the maps. Again, this is fourth in a prioritized list, so it comes after all the others. But the, the rule is when you get down to this point in the criteria, you can't bypass one group of people to get to another group of people. But again, that's unless you're doing it to achieve a, a higher priority. Then the state law also bans uh, drawing the lines or choosing a map uh, with the purpose of favoring or disfavoring uh, a political party. So those are our requirements. Those are state and federal laws. The courts have also said you can, once you've met all of those, you can look at uh, trying to minimize uh, the pairing of current council members. This we, we characterize as respect the voters' choices and leave re-election decisions up to the voters where possible rather than the lines telling the voters, sorry, you may have elected these two before, now you can only elect one. And you can also, within that uh, very small margin allowed in the equal population uh, count, you can underpopulate if a district's gonna grow faster than the others. But again, it's not a requirement, it's only a consideration once you've met all the other requirements. So that's a, a spin through it, and I'm happy to come back to that if there are questions later. As you heard from Sydney, there's uh, been quite a bit of uh, discussion in the, in the outreach efforts. And uh, we have a list here of kind of communities of interest that have been mentioned. So the uh, freeway corridors, the areas around the, the, the Moore Park and 101 freeways have come up as sharing socioeconomic and issue uh, characteristics that make them a community of interest. Uh, school attendance areas have been mentioned as ways people identify their neighborhood or community. Uh, Newberry Park has been mentioned a number of times. The downtown area, roughly defined as Moore Park to 101 to the Jans Marketplace, but there have been various discussions of where those boundaries might be. Uh, you can see Encino Vista, Westlake Village adjacent, kind of the, the eastern end of the city. Um, 
And then the upper and lower, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Irby's Road corridors. Um, hopefully I was close. Uh, Green Ridge, the Lang Ranch and Oak Brook, Eastern Newbury Park slash Amgen are all things that have been mentioned as communities of interest or neighborhoods at the uh, input session so far. So that's all introduction to get us to the maps. Uh, like I said, we got a, a very good variety of maps. We got 11 maps in from the public that have been numbered one, 101 through 111. Um, obviously, this is a challenging task. It does take a lot of work to draw a map, so we really appreciate the residents who have done that. Um, of those 11, seven of them met the population balancing requirements. So we'll show you all 11, but the, the discussion will obviously focus on those seven since they meet that federal requirement. Then to that mix, our role in this process is kind of add in uh, maps that address the communities of interest or other public interest we heard, or that just present ways of balancing different concerns in ways that the public didn't submit. And so NDC added three maps to that. So really, before you tonight, you have 10 maps. So that's why we want to try to narrow that down to two to four uh, by the time we leave here tonight. Of course, this is not the end of the map drawing process. The residents are encouraged to continue to, to try their hand at mapping, and uh, they can submit maps until June 27th. So first, just to touch on them, the maps that came in that were not population balanced or not contiguous, uh, 105 and 107 were submitted by different people, but were actually the same map, which is why they're shown with the 105 slash 107. So that was not population balanced. And actually, at, if you look at the pink District 1 at the east end of it, there's a little piece that's not contiguous um, coming down off, the, off of the bottom of District 2 there. So that's also an issue. Uh, 108 had the same contiguity issue at the uh, east end of District 1. And uh, 109 also the same contiguity issue, not population uh, balance. So these did not qualify, but people did take the time. They do reflect their ideas. Even if it's not a map that we can actually adopt, it does reflect their, uh, the input of these authors, and we wanted to be sure to get that in the record and show it to you tonight. So digging in a little bit to the um, specific maps, we'll just go through them in, in numeric order. Uh, <coughs> First, we have map 101. You can see it created there. Um, District 5 in the middle there is roughly similar in general shape to uh, what the Rec and Park District did and the Schools District did. But here's the catch we have to address in our record. Those state criteria that I mentioned, the Fair Maps Act requirements, don't apply to the School District and the, and the uh, Rec and Park District. They only apply to cities and, and counties. So they had more flexibility. So if a district somewhat like this or that has kind of an odd shape like District 5 does in this map is part of the map you want to adopt at the end, we have to be sure we have a very clear record of a community of interest or neighborhood or other higher ranked criterion being the reason that it looks that way. So as, that's part of the reason for hopefully hearing from the public this evening and, and trying to make the record for whatever map they, they want if it does have those kinds of concerns. And, and just to illustrate what I was talking about about compactness, in District 4, you can see it's mostly south of the 101, but then 5 comes across uh, to the east. D District 5 stretches the east, and 4 goes around that arm and comes up and gets population north of that arm. So that's the compactness test that uh, this would fail if it's not explained by a higher ranked criterion. So, and, and just so folks, to orient folks, the, what 4 is doing is it's coming across the freeway and getting the Russell Park area and then going up above the business corridor there. So not, it's not out, it just needs to have a very strong record explaining why those higher criteria, criteria would justify a shape like that. Map 102, um, to the right, a little bit more kind of regional districts. You can see you get a central District 5 there in the, in the middle of the city, two and three up in the north, and one and four on either end of the city. More regional, more easy to, uh, to comprehend just looking at it. Uh, next map. 103 in the top left. Um, you can see we, very common theme is the Newbury Park uh, District 1 over there, although it takes a little bit of a different shape in, in just about every map. 
This one has a similar idea of a central District 5, but shifts it north. So it's more in the, in the north part uh, along the Moore Park uh, freeway there. It crosses over in that one piece in an unusual shaped way, but um, this one as well, it's population balanced, it is contiguous. Um, there is the issue of three kind of wrapping around five, so this one has a different uh, issue we'd need to address about why it's, it's not going straight with the compactness thing. Again, we have to explain what community of interest or neighborhood that's tying together or the reasons for it. 104 to the right, um, we did get a number of, of emails endorsing this map. You can see it's got a five in the middle that's very similar to the five in uh, map 101. It's a little bit different in, in the details of where, where it goes and how it's divided. In particular, south of the 101, this has just one in four on the south side. Just the divider between them is uh, Ventu Park. Um, so uh, making the difference between one and four. And then four comes around, again, that same issue over in the east that we would need to justify. Um, we did get a question, oh, before you go, sorry. Uh, we did get a question about that District 5 and the extension out there, and isn't that not contiguous? And actually, if you go in the interactive review map that's on the website and you zoom in, it is contiguous. It's not by much. It's, it's actually the 101 freeway and then the area between the 101 and Hillcrest there that uh, is, is the width. So it's not a lot of territory, but it is geographically contiguous. So 106 and 110, and then again, I'm touching on these just at a very high level in general. We, we do have the interactive map that hopefully residents have had a chance to look at where you can zoom in and see house by house if you want to, or you can search for a specific address. And these have all been posted on the website for a week, so people have had time to look at them. Uh, 106 in the top left, and see, this brings four farther west, south of the freeway. Um, and District 1 there is, is again, Newbury Park. Uh, four then wraps around on the east side, around District 5. But 5 does not have the arm all the way out to the apartments. Uh, it's just kind of just in that neck of where the freeways come together. Then you have three really taking up the north of the city and two in the northwest in very regional configuration. 110 to the right of that, very similar. Um, the numbers <laughs> shift around, uh, well, I should say, similar on the west end, more or less. On the east side, very different. This is kind of a unique map where you get a, a northern three, uh, really a, a northeast, eastern four, and then five actually comes north of the freeway here and picks up the business corridor um, where it runs in the length where it runs in District 5. So different approach than the other maps where uh, the, the business corridor is separate from the set district that's south of the freeway. On the next one. So map 111, uh, the last of the public maps that came in before the deadline uh, to get them in posted for this meeting. Um, some different characteristics from some of the other maps. This one actually, uh, District 2 is dropping down between one and four coming across the freeway there, if you see the blue coming across. That lets five go a little bit farther nor northwest, uh, up around the hospital. You can see the little blue H there, that's the hospital area. And then you get um, three getting the north freeway corridor, uh, going to the northeast. And then again, we have that same four wrapping around, um, getting up in the hills and going around the business corridor. Then if we jump into the, the NDC maps, you can see, and again, we're the demographers, but we're not trying to make the best map. We're just trying to fill in holes. So these don't have any special weight or, or standing or anything like that. They're just additional alternatives for you to consider. Uh, the green map, you can see this one has a, it avoids that eastern compactness issue. So we're not, five is not going around four. Instead, five comes up uh, it's the southern seat, and then it comes up um, in the middle of the city and picks up a little bit of the business corridor and, and north of that, and then four starts there and just goes due east. Otherwise, it, uh, one, two, and three are similar to, to versions you've seen in other maps. And then the last two, uh, orange in the top left. You can see, again, a compact 
freeway uh, version of, of District 1. Um, this is another one where 2 comes across. It actually, this one we, we borrowed a little bit from the school and Rec and Park District where they put the, uh, the apartments that are out there. That's the, uh, the Hillcrest Park Apartments and Conejo Creek Condos. And for those who don't know those names, the Walmart and the Ralphs um, are, are just on the, on the west, east side of them. Puts that together with the area across the freeway from that area into, into two in this one. Um, four is out there in the far east. In this case, it's getting the east side. Uh, the divider there on the east between five and four is Westlake uh, running up north-south there. And then it, it circles and comes into the, the downtown area, which is divided between four and five. And last but not least, uh, yellow. Again, this is another take, a, a little bit more of a, com, a more compact version than uh, some of the earlier maps we saw, but getting a, a central, south central uh, city, District 5, and then 1, 2, 3, and 4 kind of circling around it. So again, I went through these very quickly at, at a very high level um, just to get the discussion going. I'm happy to come back in more detail and to answer any specific questions about any of the maps or where lines are in any of the different maps. Um, again, I do want to highlight this slide's in here to remind folks. The focus maps picked tonight are by no means the final map. Uh, we are certainly, what often happens is folks will take one of the focus maps that's chosen and say, well, it's pretty good, but it could be better. And, and so the tools are still out there for residents to continue to draw maps and submit maps. And then, uh, again, we're looking for a lot of, hopefully a lot of public comment on the different maps and, and what people like and don't like and which neighborhoods and communities make sense and which maps. And so this is kind of a, a quick slide that you can't see much detail, but it's got all of the population balance maps on one slide to look at at once. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have now or after the um, public comment. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Council members, any questions for staff? Yes. Mr. Engler. Oh, oh, oh hey, either Mr. way. Taylor, which, um, which way which, Mike, let's go over this way. Just um, thank you to all the citizens who developed, helped us develop these maps as well. It's, uh, it gives us a lot of uh, food for thought, mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. As, as you develop maps from your perspective, did, how much have you incorporated some of what the citizens have put in? Have, have, how did you come about with your maps? Is it a blend of the, what the citizens have, or is it completely different? So you're exactly right. It, it, especially the... Um, let me make sure I get them, refer to them correctly. Um, yeah, especially green and yellow are really drawn from pieces of different maps that the residents submitted. You know, often we get folks that look back at various projects we've done and say, well, usually the NDC map is picked. We say, well, that's because we kind of cheat because we get all the public maps in and we take ideas from each of them and put them together in different combinations than other people have entered. So ours are picked often just because we get to go last. Um, and then uh, the orange map is more of a blend of some of the ideas from the maps and looking also at the, um, the school and rec and park maps and taking some ideas from there as well. And the, the refresh my memory on the, we, we want to get a, a, nice, a, a nice more or less equal numbers. What, what is the parameters for having um, what you would consider equal numbers? Uh, I know that some of the sure. maps have up to 1,000, 1,100 difference in the populations. Right, so very quickly, the, the way the courts do it is they take the city's total population and divide it by five, and that becomes our target or our ideal district size. And then the difference in each district from that is measured as a percentage. So the districts are one, two, three, four percent over or under. The difference between the percentage of the highest or largest district and smallest district can be no more than 10 percent. So as a rule of thumb, we say plus or minus five. If someone was really carefully drawing things, they could draw one seat that's over by eight percent and four seats that are perfectly under by two percent because that's 10. But that's the narrow band. So we're really looking at a, a just over 2,000 person absolute maximum limit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. 
Um, okay, uh, in the first slide that you talked about, I think kind of highlighting how we stay in, it's not gonna be regulation, but making sure we're following the law. There was one part that said socioeconomic ge geographic areas that should be kept together. This would be, in our case, Thousand Oaks Boulevard. That'd be a, considered a, uh, a group that has similar interests that should be kept together? It certainly could be, you know, there's a clearly an economic corridor there that it's right there in the name, socioeconomic. Right. Um, the, and where the public testimony really comes in and then ultimately the council's discretion is, um, does that socioeconomic area benefit from being in one district? Because mm -hmm. you, you can have often like a, a, if you have a Sun City retirement community, obviously they have a shared socioeconomic characteristic, but they usually want to be in multiple seats because they think that you're packing them if you put them together. So that can, that second piece in particular is, is discretionary. Okay. And then second, uh, you know, you mentioned that district, districting is to, uh, I'm, I might not word this right, but sure. protect certain ethnicities so that they're represented equally, but it's not to have a district based on one ethnicity, correct? Is that how you, is that how you phrased it? I would actually separate in the, the move to district elections under the California Voting Rights Act is aimed at enhancing the voting strength of one or more uh, protected class, which is how the law refers to different ethnic and racial groups. So the change to districts is definitely aimed at improving their um, voting strength and their ability to elect. When we go to drawing lines, there's certainly the Federal Voting Rights Act we have to comply with, which has the same idea, but it's much more limited in its um, implementation. Um, and there's still the purpose of the goal in, in mind, but we don't want the percentages to be like, we're, we're picking this map because we want X percent. That's when race becomes predominant. Okay, so then when we're looking at these maps and we're looking for, let's say, equal uh, population representative in each district, should we be looking at, what, a larger percentage of an ethnicity that ends up coming into one district and I guess juxtaposing that against other maps where it's more spread out? It, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do, yeah, so it, it's a good question and comes up a lot. So yes, under the, both the state and federal law, the idea is, is if you have a protected class you, that doesn't traditionally elect a lot of their preferred candidates to office, you do want to concentrate them within all the other rules, the neighborhoods and all that, um, to the degree you can in order to concentrate their vote and allow them to get a, a seat at the table. So they prefer to, you don't wanna try to say, okay, Latinos are protected class, let's get 18% in every, every district. Okay, and then, you got one more? Um, you mentioned about elected officials and making sure you don't take one off that the people voted for, et cetera. We have uh, some maps that have uh, council members in the same district, and then we have a lot of maps where they're not. Just so I'm clear, you're saying that should be a consideration or it should not? It is. Um, an allowable consideration, but it's certainly not a requirement. So okay. after you meet all the requirements, that essentially if you have two maps that equally meet all the requirements, then the courts have said it's a perfectly acceptable tiebreaker. Okay, thank you. Mr. Adam. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So one of the criteria is uh, nearly equal population in each district, and uh, the uh, telling uh, number for that is deviation, correct? Because I'm, I'm surprised you, did, you didn't mention deviation in any of your uh, explanations about these maps, because the deviation runs anywhere from close to 10 on one all the way down to three on, on the other. Do, don't you consider that to be uh, important? So uh, smaller is better than larger, that's correct. Right, the larger um, the deviation, the less uh, di mm -hmm. equally divided the population. Yes, the, the reason I didn't highlight it is the courts have said, you know, the numbers are imperfect and things like that. If you're doing it, if you're increasing deviation a percent or two in order to follow a major road or keep a neighborhood together, the courts are never gonna choose a 7% map over a 9% map um, as long as the reason for the difference is they're trying to achieve one of the other goals. The, the, where the courts step in is when you break that 10% limit. Mm -hmm. But the courts might choose a 3% deviation versus a nine, would they not? Mm, pretty rare. Rare, okay. Yeah, they, the, as long as you're in that 10% window, 
and, and this changes. 15 years ago, yes, you had to be at zero and you had to carefully explain everyone. And a bunch of course, cases went to the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court was like, we don't want all these cases coming to us. And they really, in an okay. Arizona case, they really widened up the, the discretion. But it's a, it's a factor for us to consider, correct? Certainly. Yeah, and I notice on the two of the three maps that you drew, um, despite the opening um, slide that talked about keeping socioeconomic groups together, and I think you mentioned T.O. Boulevard specifically, two of the three split the boulevard in half. Yes, so there's, there's two <laughs> pieces to this. One is... And maybe the third, actually, if you look at it a little closely, but yeah. definitely two of the three. So why'd you do that? Well, we had, we're balancing a whole bunch of different things, so there's two pieces to it. One is the compactness issue, we need to make a clear record, and we did have a couple of comments about keeping the corridor together, um, but a couple of comments is not necessarily controlling until we get to, to the council to weigh in and say, is this a socioeconomic area that benefits from being in one district? Historically, downtowns or business corridors often actually want to be in multiple seats. It really varies from city to city. Um, so we drew them that way in part because of just the impact of the other factors, compactness being a big one, um, but we're certainly open to, to revising those maps. Like I said, the maps you're looking at today are the starting point, by no means the final ones. Okay, thank you. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, and I wanna echo Councilmember Engler's uh, gratitude to the public for submitting all these, these maps. Um, I think my first question is probably for Mr. Womack on the incumbency question. Um, I realize it's something we address after we look at many other tests, but my question is whether other cities who have gone through this exercise have um, encountered any liability whether there have been challenges to district maps that were drawn because maps were drawn in a way to advantage or disadvantage um, incumbents. Is there any history of liability there? You know, I, I'd actually defer that question to uh, Mr. Johnson, who's got a much better handle on the number of lawsuits and the type of lawsuits and the basis of those lawsuits and if any have been brought upon just that specific uh, 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 issue. Yeah, and and actually we were we were the demographers for Martinez where this issue was the heart of a, a lawsuit, mm -hmm. and um, that was before the Fair Maps Act was in place. But the the plaintiff said you looked at where the incumbents live and you shouldn't do that, and the court upheld the city's map. Um, used lots of language about it. We don't like this map, um, and the judge actually on the in the hearing asked the plaintiffs, I really hope you appeal this so that the appeals court might be able to find a way to toss this map, but I can't find one. So it, it's pretty rare for it to come up, and then it has not been, the Fair Maps Act only kicked in in 2020, and so there has not been any litigation yet on that question under the Fair Maps Act. Okay, but in the Martinez case, there was, there was litigation, the city did have um, exposure, expenses, all that, even though they ultimately prevailed, correct? I mean, there's always exposure. Right. <laughs> yes, okay. but they did prevail, yeah. Right, okay. And then just just for my own edification, I just wanna be sure I understand the, the, um, the federal side of the requirements. I, I get the, the four tests at the state level. On the federal side regarding race, do I understand correctly that it is that race may be used as a criterion, but it may not be the predominant criterion. So it, it could be used, but only in conjunction with other factors, is that correct? Exactly right, if, and it usually is used in the context of, here's a neighborhood or community of interest that is heavily this group, so let's pay particular care to that neighborhood or community of interest. Right, right, so if there are other, other factors, determinants, pick your word, for defining what constitutes a, a community of interest. That could be, race could be one of those factors, but it can't be the only one, correct? Yeah, we'd, we'd be more comfortable if it was defined based on you know, language spoken at home, income, the other factors, but race can be one of the status, 
um, live in multifamily dwelling versus single family resident, factors like that. Exactly. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then my final question is just about procedure tonight. Um, I'm just wondering how we're going to uh, uh, proceed here. I, I see there are a pretty sizable group who have expressed interest in this. Are we hearing from the public first and then having our discussion? Are we, are we, how, how are we moving forward with this? The sequence is that as soon as you finish your questions, then we move to public comment, listen to the public, and then we'll come back to staff responses. Then after that, we'll close the hearing and then we can discuss. Is that clear? It is, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions or is that it? We're good. So with that, we're gonna open it up to public comment. We have, according to my count, some 13 speakers, is that correct? So again, per usual, uh, like those that are present here, the first will step up to the microphone, the second would have a seat behind, and uh, Zoom will call you up in the order. First one we have is Wendy Zimmerman on Zoom, Zoom and then um, Karen Wilburn also on Zoom. So Wendy, you've got three minutes. Go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Uh, the presentation was informative, so I appreciate having that to add to my comments. I want to note to you that there's a lot of ugly gerrymandering going on, and it seems to be behind the interests that belong to businesses and special interest groups. The duty for voting districts is to residents. Those of us who live here, pay our taxes, get our utilities, send our kids to school. It is about residents. We register to vote based on where we live, not where we do business, not where we go to work. It's where we live. So the first duty is to make sure that the, whatever plan you go with in the end makes good sense and balances the interests of the residents and make sure that they have representation on the council. So that being said, the voting districts, sorry guys, but we do not have a duty to keep incumbents on the council. We have a duty to make sure that the council spreads across all of the various districts to represent the residents. And that council person's duty will be to provide and to be a staunch advocate for the district that he or she represents and also then to also work in the best interest of all of the city's residents. I live in Newbury Park. We don't have a rep on the council at all. We have a somewhat cohesive community in many ways, predominantly composed of single family houses. We have a few apartments, but at this point in time, we have long standing tracts of houses. We are the south side of Newbury Park is very different from the north side of the Newbury Park, which has much more big business, shopping centers, industrial parks, and those kinds of things. Shopping centers and industrial parks do not vote. Doesn't mean they're not important, but they are not voters. This is about voters. So I want to make sure that when you look at some of these plans, and a lot of the reasons have been explained, and I agree with a lot of the reason for some of the rule outs. My biggest no's are 101, 106, 105, 108, 109, 110, and 111. Just please cross those off of your list. Frankly, in going through what this meeting says, I like none of the above, none of the choices whatsoever. I think we have a lot more work to do. A business corridor is nice to have as a business corridor, but it's not a vote. Where you work and where you live are two different things. Some people work and live in very far apart locations. Other 15, people live 15 closer. Seconds. But many people out here commute long distances. So please go back to the drawing board, work to make fair districts that represent all Thank of you. us. Thank you for uh, your comments. Great Park definitely Next needs up, one. we have Karen Wilburn. Karen, you're on, you have three minutes. Karen, to, uh, unmute, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening again, I'm Karen Wilburn and from Newberry Park. I also represent Canale Valley Advocates for Sensible Planning. I know we have a lot of speakers, so my comments are, will be very short. Um, myself and CBASP opposes any map which separates the Borchard parcel from the main area of Newberry Park south of the 101. 
The Voting Rights Act requires communities of interest remain together. Since the residents of this area of Newberry Park are the ones who will be most affected by development of this parcel, it must be included in the same district. I understand that both the Caneo School and Parks districts include this parcel in, in the district to the north. However, I think we can all agree these are very different issues and this parcel has no impact on schools and parks. So the residents of Newberry Park have a right to elect the person that will oversee this parcel as well as the rest of Newberry Park south of the freeway. This would disqualify maps 101, 104, 106, 107, 108, 109, and 111. In our opinion, map 104 is the best choice. It divides the city up equally and also does the best in terms of dividing the socioeconomic areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Jennifer Gross, who is with us, and after that will be Sally Hibbets. Jennifer, please come on down. You have three minutes, and I'll let you know at 15 seconds what's Thank remaining. Much. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. My name is Jennifer Gross, and I'm a resident of Newbury Park. I'd like to talk about the district maps that are being considered. In these maps, the Newbury Park area is labeled District 1. On the maps that I've seen, all of the Newbury Park District is located on the south side of the 101. Maps have been submitted by the owner of the Borchard Parcel and his family and friends. Though located on the south side of the 101, all of these maps snip the Borchard parcel, parcel out of the primary Newbury Park District and include it within District 2 on the north side of the 101. From this, I am surmising that it is in the property owner's best interest to exclude this property from the Newbury Park District, though it will be the Newbury Park residents that are deeply impacted by any changes to the Borchard parcel. Traffic and public safety come to mind first, as Wendy and Borchard Freeway interchanges are not equipped to handle an outpouring of residents in the event of an emergency, such as the fire several years ago. I want to see the Borchard property included in the Newbury Park District. In fact, the Voting Rights Act that is driving this change requires that communities of interest remain together. The community with the most interest in the future of the Borcher Parcel is District 1, which is entirely on the south side of the 101. The Borcher Parcel should be included in the primary Newbury Park District, District 1. If any of the councilmen disagree, I would very much like to hear their rationale as part of your discussion today. I think it is important that public officials not be catering to special interests, but listening to the voices of the people they represent. Regardless of whether they want to see changes to the Borchard parcel and, or not, the residents of Newbury Park have spoken loud and clear that the Borchard parcel is relevant. It is of significant interest to the future of Newbury Park south of the 101. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Sally Hibbs on Zoom, and in-house we have Rosanna Guerrero. Rosanna, please come on down and have a seat. We'll call you up shortly. Go ahead, Sally. Yes, good evening. I want to make sure that you can hear me. We can hear you beautifully. Go ahead and begin. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Sally Hibbets, and I've been a resident of this community for 50 years, uh, and I live in Westlake Hills. Uh, obviously, there are, uh, just to let you know, I was one of only two residents to attend the MAP workshop on June the 3rd. So I do believe I'm familiar with the process and the issues. While at this very helpful workshop, I got the impression that the city demographer would more seriously address the lack of uh, ethnic minority voting strength in their proffered maps. And I'm really quite disappointed that they seem to have lost this impetus in their suggested maps. Perhaps they can be asked a question about increasing the percentage of these voters and why their projected percentages are still so low. It appears that many maps have divided this specific demographic group into much smaller pieces and kind of sticking those smaller chunks into maps rather than trying to keep them together so they could have a seat at the table as your demographer just said. Following up on the need to raise the percentage of Hispanic residents as well as apartment dwellers. In these uh, maps, the only map, 104, is the one that truly answers this need. Map 104 is superior and must be retained for further study. I also speak to the issue of dividing up the area where I live, which is Westlake Hills, uh, which has uh, been divided in several maps from the rest of the community of interest of Westlake. 
our area of Westlake runs north and south along the Westlake Boulevard corridor. This is where we shop, we go to school, we go to church, we recreate, et cetera. Uh, so to divide Westlake Hills from the rest of Westlake is absurd. On that same issue about dividing communities of interest is the Newbury Park, the Borchard property that was just addressed. That is also absurd to think that that piece of property that has been in Newbury Park since the Shumash days or whatever has, has now been divided away and it needs to be retained in that Newbury Park district. Please bear in mind those three issues. Keep more uh, ethnic minorities, increase percentages in their map, in the maps, excuse me, keep Westlake Hills as one, and keep Newbury Park as one unit. Thank you. Next up, we have Rosanna Guerrera, and after that, we have Lori Dingman. Lori, come on down and have a seat behind. We'll call you up shortly. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and City Council. My name is Rosanna Guerra, and I'm a 30-year resident of the city of Thousand Oaks. I come before you today to speak on behalf of the district maps that are before you. I participated in two of the latest community events sponsored by the demographer and have a clear understanding of the task at hand. First of all, I approve of the steps taken by City Council to proceed with district mapping. It is in keeping with actions already taken by CVUSD and the Park and Rec District. Secondly, I believe this action will prove to enhance public engagement in the political process where more voices of diversity in our community will be engaged and, and supported. What I have discovered during this process is that my fellow Thousand Oaks neighbors are concerned with producing a map that is so far from the maps already drawn by CVAOSD and the Park and Rec. The same demographer that was hired for the last districting by the Park and Rec is now taking up our city's districting. Using the same criteria and the same communities of interest, it is only fair and reasonable that the city's districting map will follow in the same way. One map that I reviewed split Westlake Village into two separate areas, which would not follow the idea or test of keeping communities of interest intact. My recommendation is to look at the maps that have already been created by CVUSD and CRPD and use those as your guidepost of maps that most closely adhere to this criteria. Um, the ones that I find that most closely uh, align with that are maps 104, 106, and 111. Map 104 most resembles where I shop, where I walk and exercise, the parks that I go to, the schools where kids in my neighborhood attend, the library that I visit. District 3 in Map 104 has been my home for 30 years. Thank you. Next up, we have Lori Dingman, and after Lori, Chase Rashid. Chase, please come on down and have a seat behind, and we'll call you up shortly. Lori, you have the floor. Good evening, council members and staff. My name is Lori Dingman, and I'm a 52-year resident of Newbury Park. As most of you know, my home backs, uh, the back of our home is 19 feet from the Borchard property. Today, I'm urging all of you to do the right and most ethical thing and ensure that the Borchard property is kept as part of the Newbury Park District. The goal of the California Voting Rights Act is to ensure that all areas and groups of people in our city have representation by someone who lives in and understands the dynamics of that area. Several of the maps before you for consideration have been submitted by the property owner, his wife, or other associates. Those maps blatantly remove this complex property from the area of Newbury Park, which is well established to be of great community interest for Newbury Park residents. In fact, 92% of Newbury Park has already given their objection to allowing a change on the general plan to mi mixed use. It's completely inappropriate and a violation of the California, California Voting Rights Act to break up such a significant community of interest. Doing so would disenfranchise every Newbury Park voter, would leave the council member in the neighboring district with no election consequences of their actions. 
I'm supporting map 104 as the most fairly balanced map, and I ask that the council and staff remove from consideration any map that unfairly removes the Borchard property from the Newbury Park District. I find it interesting that to note that all three of the NDC maps submitted by the consultant place the Borchard property uh, logically in the Newbury Park District. I'm asking staff and council to do is what is not only legally right, but also morally right, and allow our Newbury Park community of interest to be represented by a council member who will be personally affected by any deci decisions on that parcel. Newbury Park is a special part of our community, and we are counting on each of you to ensure that we are represented by someone who loves and lives in our community with us, and we and will represent residents' interests and not just developers' interests. Thank you. Next up, we have Chase Rashid, and after that, Ty Gutierrez. Chase, you have three minutes. Please oh. stand at the podium, and Ashley, come on down. I'm sorry, Ty, come on down and sit behind. Thank you. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you to the council. So first off, I just want to say um, that some of the data on the maps from the demographer, it's actually very um, inaccurate. It actually has the citizen voting age population. It has it for Hispanic, the Hispanic population. It's actually inflated from anywhere from like 10 to 13%. So that needs to be corrected because the council has to vote on a map that is accurate. So I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the socioeconomic areas. I have some items here that I want to show. So, EOTV. So, um, that shows the um, density of Thousand Oaks. And as you can see, the most dense areas are concentrated along the boulevard and um, out toward Newbury Park and up um, along the 23. So those should be kept together. This next one shows um, the uh, poverty rates and the median income rates um, in between areas that are adjacent to these dense areas. The blue areas have, are about $57,000 in median income. Uh, the green areas are like an average of 152,000 a year. So if you put those areas together, you're really gonna be diluting um, lower income areas. Um, and one last item, that's um, car ownership, and the purple areas are the areas that have lower car ownership. The areas surrounding it have higher car ownership. I'm going to explain to you why the areas along the boulevard cannot just be attached to whatever blocks are adjacent to them, because you have Conejo Oaks that is right near my neighborhood that's very low income. It has a, it has about one area in Conejo Oaks has about a um, $183,000 median income. And just below that, the area just below it, my area, it's $52,000 a year. So please take that in consideration. There's the supporting data to support that. And I was disappointed that the demographer did not seem to take a lot of the input into consideration. Um, thank you. Next up, we have Ty Gutierrez, and after that, Ashley Orozco. Ashley, come on down and have a seat behind. Ty, you're on. Hello, I'm Ty Gutierrez, um, and I just want to speak in favor of Map 104. I would be a part of what would be the fifth district. I grew up as a Latina here in Thousand Oaks over the last 25 plus years. Um, since then have become a mother myself. So I have someone here in our school district. I feel very strongly about this community and I'm involved in several fronts. Um, but I also grew up in this area, um, probably what we would consider poor. Um, and for a very long time, believe that this district that would come, in, come into place has lacked a voice um, on this uh, city council. So I implore you again to be mindful of the decisions you're going to make. 
um, as you affect the underserved populations, underrepresented, and most often underestimated populations here in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Next up, we have Ashley Orozco, and after that would be Janie A. Go ahead and proceed. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor McNamee, City Council members, and City staff. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you all tonight. My name is Ashley Orozco, and I am here as an 18-year resident of the City of Thousand Oaks. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank you, along with City staff, for the work that's gone into organizing the districting process and the efforts taken to keep the community involved and informed. It is greatly appreciated. As you move through this process, I understand there's a lot of factors to consider in making a well-informed decision. I ask that in, consider in the consideration process, the following are prioritized. Maintaining districts that adhere to the natural boundaries of our community, that communities of interest are kept together within districts, and that the integrity of maps are prioritized regardless of the positive or negative impact it might have to existing city council member seats. Thank you again for your service to our community. Next up we have Janie A, and after that would be Carol Skelton, Shelton. Good evening. I want to remind you that voters choose their representatives, and in order to do this, we need fair maps. Um, I'm a Newberry Park resident, and I would like to also um, implore you to look at that Borchard parcel and understand that it should be a part of that Newberry Park district um, and not bunched up with the uh, north side of the freeway. Um, we all need to make sure that we understand the assignment. Recognize that these maps will be used for many decades and make your decision that will affect the future for more than the present. Think of this like the 2045 plan or beyond. Imagine leaders years from now having to explain why boundaries are the way they are. Don't make them explain that they're because we were protecting elected officials. Remind you um, again of the assignment and I would just want to reiterate that we need to allow for the representation of the voters regardless of where incumbents live, allowing for multifamily housing, communities of interest, and the concentration of Latino residents. I uh, urge you to pick um, maps 104, 106, and 111 to move forward. Thank you. Next up, we have Carol Shelton, and after that would be CJ. Go ahead. Good evening, my name is Carol Shelton. I have lived in Thousand Oaks for more than 40 years. I have the privilege of being the Vice President of Adelante Comunidad Conejo, which allows me to represent and serve my community. I am a professional supporting the IDD, or Intellectual Developmental Disability Community, and I am the parent of two young men with developmental disabilities. I'm involved in my community, I am low income, I am Hispanic and I have lived in multifamily housing for the last five years. The Voting Rights Act is intended to keep communities of interest together. My community of interest is a Hispanic Latino community, disabled community, low income community, and the multifamily housing community. We share common barriers, obstacles to cr true inclusion, and do not receive the same outreach are not planned for and are not valued in our community. That is sad, but very true. Let's change that together. Maps that have the, high, the largest concentration of Hispanic, Latino, multifamily residents and low income residents must move forward. My tight knit and growing community of interest must be given the power to elect someone living in our community through this map districting process. Can you please help my community have representation? I urge you to please select the best maps for our community. It is my hope that you will only consider maps for the good of our community while protecting our marginalized community that should remain together in this map process. This is good governance. Thank you for your time. Next up we have CJ, and then after that is Ben Eduarte. CJ, you have three minutes. Good morning, I mean, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Mayor McAmee and City Council members, Thousand Oaks citizens here and virtually. 
Uh, my name is Carol C.J. Keevney. I reserve, reside in Newbury Park. And um, I want to express my uh, support for MAP 104. Uh, although a Hispanic Latino district is very important for our consideration, but we also need to consider social e economic aspects as well as racial and ethnic communities of interest uh, as justification of the maps that we eventually choose. Uh, further, Latinos are hardly one group. For instance, uh, if Oprah Winfrey and I, both black women of a certain age who grew up in the South, were to live in Newberry Park, but because of our economic differences, it's very unlikely that we would be in the same community of interest. And so because of the, uh, the fact that most of the uh, uh, apartment dwellers and lower incomes individuals, as well as Hispanic and Latino uh, residents, uh, would, would be in a community of interest that is designated in MAP 104. I think that would be the best choice. And in closing, I'd like to uh, echo the comments that have been uh, expressed earlier about keeping the portrait parcel in the Newberry Park district. It is the most sensible and it, it, it would be uh, definitely the most equitable. Thank you very much and uh, I um, urge you uh, wisdom and, <laughs> and tenacity in your decision making. Thank you. Next up, we have Ben Enderly on, or Duarte, Ben and Duarte on Zoom. Ben, go ahead. Ben, are you with us? He needs to unmute. Could you unmute, Ben? Hello. Can you unmute? And then go ahead and begin when you're ready. Hello? Ben, go ahead and speak. Yeah, I'm Ben Duarte. I'm, I'm a New Newbury Park resident for the past 30 years. And I, I would uh, support the move or the proposal to keep that water uh, parcel together with the uh, Newbury Park District. Thank you very much. And that concludes the public comment on this. Uh, city staff, uh, any response to the comments? Uh, there's many. Could you go ahead and mute yourself again there, Mr. Duarte? There you go, thank you, go ahead. Uh, many, many comments, uh, many great comments came in uh, regarding specifically that one orchard uh, parcel um, that I don't believe that is uh, a significant issue as far as making it part of that Newberry Park. I think people were just trying to find uh, where they're balancing out populations, uh, but we were able to, the, all the maps that were prepared by NDC uh, kept that uh, parcel within the uh, Newberry Park area. I think that was one of the primary considerations. The other one was uh, trying to develop a map that uh, increased um, uh, protected classification uh, numbers. And that one's going to be very difficult in our jurisdiction uh, with our uh, we have, we're subject to the Fair Maps Act, while some of the, uh, the other jurisdictions that recently went through this were not. Uh, so that, that's going to be a, a challenge for us, but I, I think uh, uh, I can let uh, Doug address some of the things that we could do moving forward with some of the maps uh, and possibly address that. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what you heard, there lots of good input um, on different communities. Um, early on, a couple of folks reeled off a series of map numbers that they posed really fast. Um, that same list is, is in a number of emails that you receive, so if, if no one caught all the numbers. <laughs> um, the, the three that they, of the population balanced ones um, that were in that long list was 101, 106, and 111 um, that folks opposed because of the port, um, the Borchard Park separation from Newberry. Um, otherwise, yeah, lots of good comments um, and, and good discussion about uh, elements that tie the, the 
two freeway corridors together and multifamily and income and other factors. I, I will note too, um, uh, Chase showed a couple of maps real quickly. Um, a couple of those we didn't have, but there are a whole bunch of socioeconomic maps similarly in the interactive review map. So folks go to that on the website. You can look at income levels and language spoken at home and all that right there on the interactive map and see how the different maps overlay with those socioeconomic factors. Other than that, I'm happy to and provide any information that would be useful. Thank you, sir. What I'm going to do is close the public hearing, open up for discussion, and I'll work from my right to left. Mr. Taylor, then Mr. Adam, then Mr. Engler, then Mr. Newman, okay? Mr. Taylor, go ahead. Okay, so we're just on discussion right now? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, uh, I guess I would start by saying we're, this is the, the start of this, so I think I'm just going to present what I think are the good starting points, and then uh, in no means am I saying this is what we're voting on, lock it in. I just, this is what I think is a good start. Um, I personally, uh, I thought map 106 was actually the cleanest in my perspective. I thought, I, I looked at it being the most similar to CRPD. Uh, I thought it was balanced. I didn't think it leaned towards uh, one political party over the other. Um, I understand that, you know, we all hear it, the Borchard property, being on the other side of the freeway is the concern, so I would just say, I think this is a good starting point. We're gonna hear more and more, and then we'll see where this map goes from there. Um, I thought map, map 111 was okay. Uh, I didn't think it was as good as 106, so I would say that would be my start if I had to pick a second and third. Maybe it'd be 111 and maybe the orange map. But I would say 106 was the strongest in my opinion. Mr. Adam. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I um, a lot of maps tonight to look at, um, but you know I, I'm looking for some certain criteria. I'm looking for a balance. I'm looking for socioeconomic continuity. I'm looking for equal population, which would mean a low deviation. I'm looking for. I'm looking for keeping the boulevard in one segment because I believe that that. Socioeconomically, that makes sense. And I also believe that the boulevard area is where most of the growth in the city is going to occur in the next, two, I don't know how many years. And I think those folks should have a vote on that. Um, <clears throat> I would have to say that, uh, oh, and I'm also looking for ma maps that are of continuity with Canal Reckon Park and, uh, and, the, and the school district, it seems to me that it might be problematic to have somebody have to vote in different districts for different elections. So it'd be nice to have some kind of continuity there. Um, I would say that map 106 has the lowest deviation. That means the most equal representation of population. Uh, it does match closely with the CRPD map. I think it keeps community interests intact. Uh, it's got good Hispanic representation in, um, let's see, that, that central district. Let's see, what is that number? Yeah, District 5, it's about it would be about 30% Hispanic, and I think it balances the Hispanic um, population uh, nicely with uh, District 2 as well. Um, I think that uh, there could be some possibilities with 104. I think it has a few drawbacks. Um, not quite as strong as 106. Deviation's a little higher. Uh, the Hispanic population is, that's the, the, most of it is concentrated in just one district, so there might not be as much of a chance to have representation for underrepresented communities, which is exactly why the main thing that the Voting Rights Act is for. And 111 is pretty much the same as 106 from, from what I can tell. So uh, these, these maps are gonna take some discussion, of course, but and a lot of them were ruled out immediately because they were non-contiguous, or for, for other reasons. The consultant maps I found to be lacking. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, 
Uh, they, they split the boulevard too much, um, too, too many things wrong with those maps. So I guess I'd have to narrow it down to uh, those three, with, which I think 106 would, would be the strongest of the three. Mr. Engler. Yeah, thank you, and um, appreciate all the work. And again, thank you to the citizens for getting involved. Um, the, my, my, uh, my criteria really is to try to keep our, our areas, our new districts, as population equal as possible. Um, I want to make sure that communities of interest are kept together. Um, and then if, uh, if we can, make them as similar to uh, Recreation Parks District and the school district so that we can uh, lessen the confusion when it comes time to vote. Uh, I think uh, having it, uh, having them overlay as much as possible is, is a good thing. So with that said, um, I would agree with the speakers that I, I, I think we have a very strong dividing line in the 101 freeway, uh, especially in Newberry Park. Uh, there's, uh, if, if, it, if you have to do it for population uh, balance and parity, then we'll see what we need to do. But I think that dividing line is, should be respected. Uh, the south side of the freeway versus north side of the freeway is something that um, I think all of us in the audience and everybody in town recognizes that that's a natural barrier as much as a river would be. So uh, I, I would uh, give a lot of weight to keeping those areas together. Uh, as some of the speakers mentioned, the people in Newberry Park do have a, an interest in being Newberry Park as well. So that's an, a, a built-in area of interest. Um, as long as uh, the, there's other areas of interest, I think that we need to respect as well. Um, and I think the ones that do that the best uh, and, and mirror uh, Recreation Parks District to a, a pretty great degree and also somewhat the same footprint as the school district is, is MAPS um, 106 and 111, 104 does to a certain degree, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, skipping around, and 104 skips around a little bit, as does the Recreation Parks District map, skips around a little bit down the freeway. Why is that an area of interest? Because that is an area that, as I was pointed out by one of our speakers, an area of um, uh, people who are not as well healed as others, that that's an area where we have a lower income level. Plus, there's a very strong interest in that area of people who are uh, in multi-residence uh, uh, living situations. And that is only going to continue to increase as we do more uh, development along the boulevard in, in accordance with the specific plan. So I think that's an area of interest that we probably should keep in mind and, and keep together. Um, the other areas, uh, frankly, um, you know, my area, which is typically area two, um, is mainly single family residents. We have that uh, together in our, in our way. Um, up in uh, uh, Lang Ranch area, same thing, same type of demographic, same type of uh, home ownership. Uh, those are the areas, I think, that have a common interest as well. So we should have those represented. So my, my main things, again, um, respect these natural boundaries that we have. Um, let's uh, make sure that our areas of interest are respected. And uh, if, if we can, let's keep the um, overlays of the different uh, election districts as similar as we can. Mr. Newman. Thank you. I, I agree with many of the comments that have been made so far. Um, Councilmember Adams spoke of the need for balance and, and not having too much skew population-wise between groups, and that's important. You know, in fact, we've tossed some maps that just failed on that test, so that that makes gets the number somewhat lower, even though we still have a lot of maps in front of us. Um, I also want to um, concur with Councilmember Engler um, in terms of using either natural or or highway or thoroughfare major thoroughfare boundaries, um, making logical places. And even more important to that is, to the extent possible, keeping communities of interest together. 
And that's going to be the main theme in my comments here. Um, so working from west to east on the Borchard parcel, um, I think it fails the community of interest test to put that north, to put that in a district that is primarily north of the 101 because the people who would be most affected by whatever happens there, and that's not the question before us tonight, but whatever we do there, the community that would be primarily affected is the community of Newbury Park. So just on those grounds alone, I think that parcel belongs below the 101, like most of the rest of the what what is drawn as District 1 in most of these maps. So that that's that area. Um, the there is, as Council Member Engler noted, a strong cohesion of socioeconomic and uh, living uh, commonality in uh, District 5. And for that reason, I favor uh, Map 104 f head and shoulders above any of the others. Um, it is true that you could say, well, it's kind of a funny shape, but that does not necessarily mean it fails the compactness or the contiguity test, as the demographer, the expert in this area, has testified. Um, in fact, many other districts in many other maps are much less compact. So in terms of keeping a community together, I think one of the speakers said, where do people live? What kind of housing do they have? Multifamily versus single? What, what income level? are they at? What, where do their kids go to school? All of that is this is a community of interest. And we're not, we're not even, let's not even get into the race issue because I realize that can be a contentious one. Just on socioeconomic grounds alone, um, the District 5 in Map 104 is similar to the Central District. I think it's District uh, three in the CRPD, yeah, District Three in the CRPD map. Um, that's that's a logical grouping of a community that has common interests, and for that reason alone, I think 104 is a very good map. Um, there were some other comments made about the wisdom of dividing up the boulevard or not. I think I agree with our first speaker. I want to remind everyone here that we are here to get fair representation of people, not of businesses, not of economic interests. That's not to say economic interests are unimportant. They are very important, and they should be. And it may be that at some future date, there will be more housing that would justify extending that central district to include all of the boulevard. But I, my belief is that including what we call the Westlake Hills neighborhood as part of that central district would dilute the community of interest because it is a very different socioeconomic group and type of living than most of the rest of that district. So there is a reason that the split was made in the CRPD map. I think it, it would make sense to do the same thing here by not violating or diluting a community of interest. And the final thing I'll say is, as, as staff testified at the outset here, it would be nice to have alignment with our school board maps and with our rec and park maps. It would certainly be a lot less confusing for all of us. Um, but two things on that. Number one is, yes, we can use that as a factor, but only after we've considered all these other tests. And, and things like, communities of interest, things like natural boundaries must come first. Um, that's, that's not a value statement. That's what the laws in this area have told us we have to do. That's number one. Um, number two, even if we wanted to have perfect alignment with schools or with rec and parks, we couldn't because these are different agencies that were formed at different times that have different territories and different populations. So I agree to the extent possible we should keep these as similar as we can, but number one, only after we've done all these other tests, 
of which I think communities of interest and compactness are the most important ones. And then number two, um, realizing that we can never achieve true 100% alignment unless we vote to take over the other agencies. And I don't think that's, that's not a question before us tonight. Thank you. For sake of organized uh, discussion here, I'm gonna propose the following. I would like to pull each council member their top two, three maps. I will record that and I've asked our city clerk to record the selections as well. Then we'll come back and look at the top ones that have three or more for more discussion and then come back hopefully for a final vote after that discussion. Are we all in alignment? Very good. Mr. Taylor, start with you. Which maps do you like? And I will do a straw vote here and our mm. wonderful city clerk will do the same. The map I like the most is 106. If I had to put two, it'd be 106, 111. Mr. Adam? Microphone? Yes. Um, 106 and 111. Mr. Engler? Like, yeah, one, oh, I think 106 and 111 have, have some merit. I, I also appreciate um, uh, how 104 does line up somewhat with the Recreation and Parks District. Um, there's some parts of it that are, you know, I, I don't think we are directing anyone tonight to say, okay, this is the map we're going with. Um, this is, there's some parts of 104 that I think are good. There's some parts of 111 that I think are good. I would like to see a blending of these to come up with a little bit better based on the direction we've given. So I'm just confirming, 104, 106, 111, is that correct, yeah. sir? Very good. Mr. Newman? Yeah, and I'll, I'll be sort of the mirror image of Council Member Engler's comments where 104 I'm fine with as is. Um, after that, I would be okay, secondly with 111 and 106, but if and only if they move that Newbury, uh, the Borchard parcel, to be part of Newbury Park. Could you state those one more time for me? Sure, uh, 104 as is, no changes. Um, I, I could support 111 and 106 as second and third choices, but if and only if the Borchard parcel was part of District 1 in Newbury Park. Yeah, right. I, I would agree with that too. I, I, think, I think we do have to respect that freeway as, as a real dividing line. Um, so, you know, that, that's what I mean. There's parts of these things that I like, parts of them I don't like. I'd like to see a blend of it based on the criteria that we've put forward to our consultant. So just to confirm, Mr. Newman, we have 104, 106, and 111. Is that correct, sir? What with the modifications? Yeah, on, on, on my second oh. and third choice is with modifications. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that later. I'm just trying to get them down here. So yes. let me do a quick count here. I'm gonna go with 106 and 111. So where I'm coming out with my count, Madam Clerk, would you please confirm with me? For 104, I'm getting a vote of two, 106 a vote of five, and 111 a vote of five. Is that your count as well? Are you including your vote? Yes, 106 and 111. Yes. Mikey, you have a comment? All I was gonna say is uh, we're not voting on them just pushing them forward. We're gonna have further conversation and then we'll get more detailed maps up into possibly 10 at the next meeting. Well, yes, that's correct, but we're gonna now come back with the two that made the cut of three okay. or more. Mr. Mayor. 106 and 111. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Sorry, before we proceed, can you please repeat the, the outcome? Outcome. We have 104 has two. Let me know when you're ready. Mm -hmm. 106 has five votes. 111 has five votes. Let me know when you're ready. We good? Okay. Thank you. So the next point right here we're gonna do is discussion of those three, 104, 106, 111. Mr. Newman, you've articulated some, and again, go right to left. Mr. Taylor, do you have any comments regarding 104, 106, 111 to give direction regarding the maps to our demographer? Um, I think really what I stated in the beginning, uh, the things I liked about it is, I think it's really very similar to CRPD, uh, it seems balanced to me. Uh, Teal Boulevard, I do think it's important to keep together. We talked about the Borchard property, which uh, uh, I'm all for and expecting that to be part of the revisions in the next map. 
And so that, I, I, think that's, I think that one's the strongest in my perspective. Very good, sir. Mr. Adam. Well, again, uh, this is just the opening discussion. And as I understand it, we'll even be getting more public maps. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, we may see some other iterations we haven't seen tonight. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have to go over what okay. I said before. I just think uh, 106 and 111 are probably the two just, strongest for me. I just want to give everybody an opportunity to speak so no one feels uh, missed. Mr. Inger, any comments regarding? Always. Always. No, I, I, uh, like I say, some of, the, some of the things in some of these maps um, I like, some of them I don't. Um, and I, I don't have the demographics right in front of me to be able to say, well, do it this way. But um, I'm, I'm, I really want to emphasize uh, areas of interest. Um, and if, we, if you look at map 106, where we have uh, you know, the higher density housing along the boulevard up to the Oaks Mall, which will eventually probably have some housing. Um, those, those are the areas, if th those are high density housing that's going in. Um, I don't think it has a whole lot of um, in common with the area east of the 23 freeway for the most part. So I, I, I would maybe see if we can excuse me, massage that to be able to more reflect the higher density of some of the other areas. Um, 111 is kind of reflects that uh, in, in the way it's laid out. Um, so that, that is more to my liking. Um, again, I think we have to respect the 101 river uh, as far as which way we go with uh, uh, the Borcher property, Newberry Park and all that. Uh, so I, I think that's my comments. And I, I don't know, I don't have the information in front of me to be able to slice and dice and say which road we should use as a new border, but that's my input. Mr. Newman, you already commented before, but please continue if you want to say others. Thanks. Um, uh, number one, again, I, I would not support 106 or 111 as is because of the, the border placement out of, out of Newbury Park. Um, I, I agree with Council Member Engler about using uh, freeways or major thoroughfares as, mm -hmm. as lines of demarcation. And 106 is problematic on that score in terms of what it's doing with the 23. Um, and then on both of them, the, the concern I have that 104 doesn't have is, is that we are diluting um, a lower income community of interest in, in both these 106 and 111. Um, it's not clear to me how single family residents, Westlake Hills, um, which is certainly higher income, um, what that has to do with the community of interest immediately west of there, which is lower income and multifamily. Um, and, and the schools may be different as well. Uh, so I'd like to see some massaging of that to get the, that central district, District 5, to be more similar to what Rackman Parks did in its map. On, Thank the, you. on 106 and 111. Okay. For me to now, here's, to here's the situation. Can I say one thing? Oh, sure, go ahead, oh, Mr. I'm Adam. sorry, man. Go ahead. Yeah, I just was looking at these percentages here, and I noticed this from the outset. Uh, 106, we're talking about three <laughs> maps here, and I think 106 has the best or the most balanced representation of underrepresented communities throughout the five districts. Yeah, where if you look at 104, uh, there's heavy representation in five, but it leaves out some of the other districts. So if you're looking for balance, I would say, especially when it comes to underrepresented communities, I think 106 has the, the better balance. That's all. Now I'd like to point something out to everyone here. We could go and vote for the three that have been talked about, 104, 106, 111. There's only two that have more than three vote, three votes or more. So one or four, if I put that to a vote, is only going to get two, and that's out already. We're left with 106 and 111, with, which both have five votes. We can do this one of two ways. We can go through and vote on 104 and come up with the same result, and that's out. 
We can vote on 106 and that's in. 111, that's in. Because we have five votes for 106 and 111. Do you wanna go through and do voting individually or do we wanna agree that we can drop 104 because it has two votes? Mr. No, I, I, Mr. Newman was first, then we'll go to you, Mr. Engler. Okay. Yeah, when, when we, we, we all meet with staff individually before these council meetings. And my understanding from our staff meeting was that our brief at this meeting was to narrow down the list of how 10, 12, however many maps we had. The number I was given was two to four. It was not two, it was two to four. And I believe staff used that, that same range this evening. So we were, not, we were not told as an exercise here to come up with two. So just on that basis. I, Mr. Newman, my, I'm not coming up with two. I'm saying this is how the vote turned out just now. And let's go to Mr. Engler, go ahead. I, but, but, but Mr. Mayor, you, what, what you are doing by, by saying that, that one is, is effectively suggesting we should be looking at the others instead. And I'm saying no. We, we, we should be looking at a range of two to four, as staff asked us to do, and that is not just two maps, it's two to four maps. Mr. Engler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my understanding of our, our, our exercise tonight is not really to come up and vote on maps per se. Um, these maps are an, ex are an example of what we, we think is something of value that perhaps um, uh, needs, to, well, obviously, they need to be massaged more. Um, so I think my, in, my thought for tonight was to be able to bring input to our, um, to our staff, to our consultant, to be able for them now to take this input, look at these three maps or whatever we come up with as a way of then developing more maps, and we're going to get more maps from the citizens anyway, and all then we need to uh, blend all of those together. So I think um, right now I'm, I'm fine with presenting these three to staff and saying this is what we kind of have in mind. Give us something that blends these together and then with the other maps coming in. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Here's, go ahead. Um, all right. Well, how about we do this? In deference to my two colleagues at the end there, uh, and in deference to the audience and some of the speakers, I'll move 104, 106, 111. Very good, so what we'll do, please, what we'll do then is we'll, we now have three votes for 104, which puts it on the radar. All three. I'll yeah, I, I understand, but I'm okay. just saying right. by you doing that, now we put 104 on the radar because that's three or more. Yeah, and that, we'll, was, we'll talk that was about the ground it. rules that I laid down in the beginning. So, Madam Clerk, what I'd do is like to call the vote Be to approve. Before we go, I just want to okay. ask our staff over there, do you have sufficient information? I want to make sure that you have no questions on clarity. Do you have the direction that you need tonight? Yeah, I believe so. We, we, we do have to, and when we, when we come back, the, we'll take, these, take the information that you provided us tonight, and what we'll come back with is hopefully a, a good reflection of what you've expressed tonight but also that meets the criteria under the uh, Fair Map Acts. Thank you. Now there's two parts to this. One is selecting the maps for consideration for staff to look at and massage a little bit as been described. Second part is potential election sequencing, which we'll deal here in just a moment. So Madam Clerk, are we clear that we're just voting on map 104, 106, and 111 for staff to take back, is that correct? Excellent. So can I have a Motion on that. Do we have to talk about sequel on this one as well? So can someone make a motion on this for me? I'll Mr. motion. Mr. Taylor. Uh, yeah. And say sequel as well. And this isn't a violation of sequel, as I'm supposed to say. You did very well. Okay, thank you. And let me check with the city attorney. Am, am I good? Yeah, All right. Good. Madam Clerk, go ahead. The, the only thing before you right now is a motion to move the maps 104, 106, and 111 forward including the discussion points that have been brought by council. Excellent. Is that Mr. That's Ray, it? If, if I can and, ask a clarifying question, yeah. just there is sequencing that's on the PDF maps that have been posted on the website. So I just want to clarify, are you intending to move the maps that are just listed with the sequencing as posted or did you want to take sequencing as a separate We're going to do sequencing next. Okay. So Madam Clerk. 
Councilmember Engler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. So let's move on to the sequest, election sequencing. Uh, I'd like to open this up for council discussion. Let me move left to right this time. Mr. Newman, do you have any, you usually have comments, so that's why I'm just assuming. Well, just as, just as we're saying, it, it would be nice to have alignment with the school board and rec and parks maps. My, my, my own take on sequencing is it would be the least confusing to maintain the current order that we have where there would be uh, elections for two council members in 2024 and then for three council members in 2026. Mr. Uh, Engler, any comments? You're good? No, and I'm not sure um, what the other uh, agencies, what their sequencing is right now, uh, whether they're on the, uh, they're, they're on the two year coming up, the two, two districts coming up next year. So, so I would think that keeping that standard would be helpful as well. Um, and uh, so then it would be, you know, if, if we're looking at one of the maps, just for, for instance, we're looking at four and five, kind of, would be up for next year, and then the other three would be up after that. Mr. Adam? Yeah, I, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but I see no need for change. We got two coming up in 24, and we got three coming up in 26. We just keep alternating, two and 28, three and three, et cetera, et cetera. So just keep it the way it is. Mr. Taylor. Hey. Yes. Excellent. Madam Clerk, so we're gonna keep the sequencing where we have two seats coming up in 2024, that being myself and Mr. Adam, and then 2026 will be Mr. Taylor, Mr. Newman, and Mr. Engler. We need a motion. We need a motion from the floor according to city and attorney. I was so quickly, moved. I'm and looking at, I'm looking at Doug it, to make sure Doug, he has go ahead. If I can just clarify, uh, just on the wording, it's the same effect, but because in one map, the two of you are in the same seat, so if we can just phrase it as districts four and five would be in 2024, the others in 2026, that would Excellent. that. Excellent, so I need a motion. Who would so, like so I'd, I'd love to move it. We got a rush to motions here. You've had two so far. I'm gonna give it over to Mr. Adam. I have. Did I win? Yes, you won. So moved. Well, you have to talk about CEQA there. It's not oh, a violation and this is not a violation of CEQA. Excellent, you did that really well. Did I get that right? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion also passes five to zero. Well done, gentlemen, nicely done. We'll move to 8B. City Clerk, would you please open the hearing? Oh, we have a five-minute recess. We'll take a break here shortly. Good.
all come back and have our seats here. Five minutes goes by rather quick. All right, thank you. Let's get uh, underway. My thanks again. Can we have the council come back to uh, seats? Come on, Bob. We have our council members in the audience socializing, saying hello to all their friends. Can we come on back, council members? And I'd like to say thank you to our city clerk and recording secretary for doing a wonderful job tabulating for us on that last vote. Thank you very much. We are waiting for Mr. Adam and Mr. Newman, who hopefully will be on board here shortly and will get underway. We have a quorum. We could actually begin right now, but I'm going to give them the courtesy of showing up. Yes, would you please? We'll get underway here in just a moment. Don't disappear. We say five minutes, we mean five minutes. All righty, let's get underway. Madam Clerk, would you please open the hearing? Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item number 8B, proposed 333 unit mixed use apartment complex located at 2150 West Hillcrest Drive. Thank you. Uh, staff will be uh, presenting Justin Kendall, Justine, sorry, Justine Kendall, Associate Planner. The floor is yours. Thank you, City Council and uh, members of the public. The presentation before you is a request to demolish the existing commercial building and construct a new 333-unit mixed-use apartment complex. The applicant's request is that the City Council certify the environmental impact report prepared in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, and recommend approval of the applications listed uh, through two separate resolutions and two separate ordinances. The subject property is an 8.28 acre lot, generally located north of the US 101, east of Rancho Conejo Boulevard and a gas station, south of Hillcrest Drive, and west of an existing multifamily apartment complex known as the Linden Apartments. The site is currently developed with an existing roughly 50,000 square foot two-story office building and related surface parking lot with landscaping approved in 1982. The topography of the site descends slightly from the northeast corner of Hillcrest Drive to the rear of the developed area, which abuts a row of existing trees and a channelized drainage course. The residential capacity allocation for the project was approved by the City Council on April 27, 2021, along with the initiation of the general plan amendment. The RCA approved the allocation of 246 Measure E units to the subject property. This approval was extended on March 29th of last year, following the submittal of the pre-application. The formal applications for this project were submitted starting August 9th of last year. On June 5th, uh, the Planning Commission heard the item and recommended approval with some slight revisions to language uh, which strengthened the affordable housing requirements. The proposed project includes, uh, again, the construction of a four-story podium mixed-use complex, which would contain 333 multifamily residential units with common areas and amenities, and 5,300 gross square feet of commercial space above semi-subterranean parking structures. Landscaping is provided throughout the open spaces, landscape buffers, and along the walkways within the site. 
the project would create a mixed-use residential apartment community comprised architecturally of two buildings, which would appear above ground uh, as five larger structures and one smaller leasing amenity or amenity building. The northerly building uh, fronting Hillcrest Drive, also known as Building A, uh, encircled here in blue, would be mixed use, with three levels of apartments above a ground floor of mixed residential and two commercial tenant spaces. In addition to those commercial spaces, the residential amenities and units in this building are more commercial in nature, such as the large lobby, co-working area, two live-work units, and indoor bike storage rooms, which contribute to its mixed use style. The southern building, or building B, uh, seen here circled in pink, will actually, again, appear above ground to be five buildings, four apartment buildings connected by various walking paths, breezeways, and bridges, and one standalone amenity building. Additional indoor and outdoor amenities would be provided to the residents throughout the site, including a playground, swimming pool, courtyards with active play spaces, roof decks, and a dog park. To look in more detail at Building A, moving from the east entrance to the west, the project's architectural design is a modern style. Building A includes a variety of material changes throughout. The exterior, wall, exterior walls of the building are earth-toned colors primarily consisting of stucco finishes, simulated wood fiber cement panels, and brick veneer, heavily featured in this rendering, showing the view from the entrance closest to the existing multifamily development. Building A, seen here from Hillcrest Drive looking southwest, is located behind an existing landscaped berm with protected oak trees to remain in place. Seen partially here is the fourth floor step back which runs above the entire north and west facades. The two commercial units can be seen here on the ground floor of the northwest corner of Building A. Design features pictured in this rendering also include a first floor step back, a second floor roof deck, uh, a similar one is provided on the south side as well, and fourth floor roof deck above that. Trellises are included above the commercial units to provide additional articulation in this area closest to the intersection of Hillcrest and Rancho Conejo adjacent to the existing gas station. Continuing to wrap around to the west, Building B, seen here from inside the landscape buffer on Rancho Conejo uh, Boulevard, or on the Rancho Conejo Boulevard side, rather, uh, also includes a fourth floor step back required by the proposed specific plan 24 as seen here. Architecturally, the proposed building design, materials, and landscaping complement existing uses as the color palette of browns and grays mimic the colors used in the adjacent commercial and residential developments. The exposed elevations of the parking garage are obscured from view by the ground floor commercial and residential uses. In the case of building A, and clad with uh, board form concrete and landscaping to remain architecturally compatible with the rest of the building. In the case of building B, as you can see from this rendering from inside the property boundary and landscape buffer area on the 101 freeway exit ramp side. The one to four story project uh, would be 55 feet tall at its highest point, although most of the buildings are below that height. Development surrounding the site includes uh, a one story gas stations, two story commercial and residential buildings. Oh, excuse me, I'm getting excited. And a three story office structure directly across from the project site to the north. As ground elevations increase from south to north, that three-story office building and the subject building would be approximately the same height when viewed from the street. The landscape buffers and surface lots provide extended setback area between the proposed development and the existing adjacent properties. In addition, fourth floor stepbacks shown in pink here are provided on the external facades to further reduce the appearance of height from neighboring properties. The unit types within the buildings include one bedroom, one bedroom plus a den, two bedroom, uh, two bedroom live work, and three bedroom units. 30 of these units are proposed to be designated as affordable to very low income households, those with an income less than 50% of the Ventura County average median income, and three units are to be affordable to moderate income households, those with an income less than 120% uh, of the Ventura County average median income. To break it down into more detail and explain how the applicant is utilizing state density bonus law, 
The maximum density for this project without a density bonus is 246 dwelling units, using the formula you see in the first line. Uh, the applicant is proposing that 11% or 28 of the 246 units uh, be affordable at the very low income level. By providing 11% of the base density units for residents with very low income levels, the applicant is entitled to up to a 35% density bonus. This allows the applicant to add up to 87 more dwelling units for a total of 333 units maximum. In addition, the applicant has agreed to provide two additional very low income units and three moderate income restricted units for an overall total of 33 affordable units, which is five above the minimum amount to qualify for the 87 density bonus units. Currently, the City of Thousand Oaks requires a minimum level of service grade of C at all intersections, with the exception of Rancho Conejo Boulevard at Hillcrest Drive and specific intersections on Thousand Oaks Boulevard, which are required to, remain, to maintain a level of service D or better. According to the traffic study conducted for this project, the existing intersections studied, which are marked here with yellow dots, currently operate at a level of service C or better during morning and evening peak hours. This would remain unchanged by the proposed project. In addition, as required by CEQA, a vehicle miles traveled analysis uh, was conducted to evaluate the project's transportation impacts, which determined uh, that the impacts resulting from the project would be less than significant and no mitigation measures are required. Primary ingress and egress to the site is provided from two bi-directional driveways, uh, both accessed from Hillcrest Drive. Within the site, two roadways leading to the parking garage entrances are lined with sidewalks and surface parking spaces. In addition, a pedestrian-oriented street bisects the property between the mixed-use building, Building A, and the residential-only building, Building B. This street provides access to temporary parking and loading areas as well as parallel parking spaces to serve the commercial uses. The site provides on-site parking for vehicles while accommodating and encouraging other multimodal transportation methods as well. The project proposes to exceed both state and specific plan requirements as 100 bike and scooter spaces are being provided, including 16 electric bicycle charging stations and 20 electric scooter charging stations. A total of 581 parking spaces are proposed for the proposed uh, mixed use and apartment buildings through a mix of both subterranean garage and surface parking. Pursuant to the state density bonus law, the parking ratios required for multifamily apartment buildings are one parking space per one bedroom unit and 1.5 parking spaces for a two or three bedroom unit with no guest parking required. The applicant is proposing two spaces per two or three bedroom unit instead. In addition, the project will provide infrastructure for electric vehicle charging stations beyond state law requirements. Surplus parking is provided beyond the requirements laid out in the specific plan. Landscaping is provided throughout the open spaces, landscape buffers, and along the walkways within the site. If the project is approved, a formal landscape plan will be required, and technical evaluation of that plan will be provided through a landscape plan check process. Approximately 20% of the total site area uh, consists of common outdoor space. The proposed project includes public and private amenities. Public amenities include the outdoor seating area located at the western entrance of the site, as well as a heavily landscaped walking path along the western property line adjacent to Rancho Conejo Boulevard to complement the city's gateway sign, uh, which is to be um, replaced and enhanced by the applicant team. Private common amenities include approximately uh, 50,000 square feet of indoor and outdoor spaces. These amenities uh, for the residents use only would include outdoor landscaped open space areas, a swimming pool, a playground, barbecue areas, and a dog park. Three roof decks are provided in building A and one on building B, each including seating areas and planting areas. Indoor common amenities including uh, uh, or include a co-working area, fitness room, game room, and lounge. Private amenities are provided for each individual unit as well as the public and common facilities. All units include private open space, either in the form of a balcony or private stoop that range from between 50 to 480 square feet with an average size of 88 square feet. 
In addition, a minimum of 56 cubic feet of private storage locker is provided per unit to supplement the bicycle storage facilities and private open spaces. The site contains 28 protected coast live oak trees. The project design requires the removal of 17 protected coast live oak trees and encroachment into the protected zone of eight oak trees, which were all planted as part of a previously required landscape plan. The three trees which grew from acorns will be saved and not encroached upon. The removal of 17 protected oak trees is necessary to allow adequate vehicular and pedestrian circulation and parking facilities, the latter being stated as a city council priority during the public hearing initiating the general plan amendment and allocating the residential capacity. Existing protected trees located along the public right-of-way pri were prioritized for preservation both with and without conditional encroachments. 20 Coast Live Oak, 20 Valley Oak, um, and 11 Western, Western Sycamore trees are to be provided on site per the replacement tree plan. In order to provide the applicant um, Future flexibility, a special use permit for the on-site sale and consumption of alcohol has been requested as part of this project. The specifics of future tenants, including exact business type and hours of operation, are not currently known. However, future businesses that intend to utilize a liquor license within the property's commercial area would be allowed the option to transfer the SUP to their name and assume the responsibilities of um, the permit through review and approval of a minor modification application prior to occupancy. The resolution to approve the special use permit is separate from the resolution to approve the rest of the project applications in order to allow future tenants the ability to accept the conditions of approval for the special use permit only and for the city to revoke that entitlement more easily should cause for that arise in the future. The project requires a general plan land use amendment to change the designation of the site from commercial to commercial residential, as well as the zoning designation from Community Shopping Center, or C3, to specific plan 24 to accommodate the proposed mixed use development. A specific plan is proposed as the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code does not currently include a zoning designation that allows a mix of commercial and residential uses on the same site. The specific plan includes custom development and design standards, permitted land uses, infrastructure requirements, implementation measures, and other criteria. These standards are not required to replicate the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code standards since they are intended to be unique for a specific development area. However, they must be and are in conformance uh, or consistent with the general plan. A development agreement is required for approval of projects that receive allocation of Measure E units. This agreement is a contract between the property owner and the city to ensure specific deliverables and site expectations are in place to ensure public benefit, such as the inclusion of affordable units and site improvements. If the project is approved and constructed as proposed, the city will have 300 market rate, 30 very low income, and three moderate income restricted affordable units to add to its residential stock and count towards the current Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA, requirements from the state, as well as the demolition of an aging commercial site, inclusion of amenities and electric charging stations, and the replacement of the existing city gateway sign. In return for these public benefits, the uh, applications will be considered for approval and the requisite Measure E units will be permanently allocated. Additional points of this development agreement include timelines for the construction, uh, descriptions of major and minor amendment criteria, uh, and other items. In accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, a comprehensive evaluation of the potential environmental impacts for this project was performed. This evaluation determined that the project could have a significant effect on the environment without appropriate mitigation measures in place. Therefore, uh, an environmental impact report was prepared for the project. Appropriate measures listed here are detailed in the report and mitigation monitoring and reporting plan attached to the larger resolution before you this evening to ensure mitigation is in place so no significant adverse environmental impact results from the project. A notice of availability was posted with a 45-day public review period for the draft EIR between April 7th, 2023 and May 22nd, uh, also 2023. 
correspondence was received from the public, um, non-agency, as well as public agencies, uh, including the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District, California Department of Transportation, Ventura County Environmental Health, and Ventura County Fire Department regarding the draft EIR, which are um, included in the response to comments within the final EIR. None of the comments received on the draft EIR for this project merit, merit any substanti substantive change to the environmental analysis or conclusions contained in the draft EIR. Further, comments requesting to have the draft EIR recir recirculated are unsupported by their record and are meritless. The proposed project has been designed to meet the intent of the city's standards, codes, and policies. The proposed building design and site layout integrates well with surrounding development and has a cohesive architectural design, meeting the city's architectural design guidelines. Staff recommends approval of this project subject to the conditions of approval in the attached ordinances and resolutions. Staff recommends that the city council adopt a resolution to certify the final environmental impact report associated with 2022-70774-EIR uh, in accordance with CEQA and approve the general plan amendment, uh, the develop development permit, and the protected tree permit to separately adopt a resolution to approve the special use permit and to introduce an ordinance to approve the zone change and the specific plan and to separately introduce an ordinance to approve the development agreement. That concludes my presentation. I am available for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Council, any questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and thank you to staff and, and to the, uh, to the uh, developer for coming forward with this fine project. I think uh, it, it again underscores the value of our process here. And I, I, it is a difficult process at times and it takes some time, but I think we wind up with some decent uh, uh, input. One, um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the EV parking. You mentioned it's 5% above the code. Um, what does that work out in numbers? Uh, and, and that's EV in place, EV ready, EV, uh, uh, there, there's different categories. How, how are we uh, uh, defining those? Let me look up those numbers. I don't have them off the top of my head, but I do have them with me. I'll come back to it. Okay, and, and a lot of the other uh, developments we've been approving lately have been um, at least Cal Green um, compli compliant or LEED compliant. What, what is the status of this particular uh, agreement, uh, development agreement we have with the, the applicant? I'm sorry, can you repeat, was the question of, are they the, compatible the, with the Cal Green requirements the Cal generally? Green or, or, you know, as far as LEED uh, and where, where on the spectrum are we finding this uh, development? If I may. Currently, the project would be required as any project to comply with Cal Green and the building code standards as it relates to that. The applicant can provide further clarification if they intend to increase that to meet the standards of a gold, silver, or bronze LEED certification. But the minimum requirements currently listed in the staff report is to comply with the building code, which are base Cal Green standards. Very, very good. And. Um, I have another question. I think it's better left to the applicant, but uh, um, that's all I have right now. And if I may, Mayor, uh, just to answer Council Member Engler's question on the chargers, uh, my understanding is we have 226 EV capable parking spaces, 174 EV ready parking spaces, and 57 EV chargers, which is 10% of the overall parking, um, which is at equipped at level two EV SE supply equipment. Also, just to be clear, which was a, a point mentioned at the Planning Commission meeting, was that they are doing electric charging for the bicycle and scooter sections um, because we, as you guys know, we are starting to see a lot more electric bikes and electric scooters. So that was another addition that they added for the biking uh, area. Well, you think that's a pretty impressive numbers for the EV, EV ready and EV on site charging is pretty good. Thank you. So if no more questions for staff, we'll come back to the developer shortly. I want to go over to City Attorney Tracy Noonan. She has an announcement. 
Thank you, Mayor Magnamy. Um, for the council's information, based on discussions with the applicant, staff does recommend that after receiving public comments tonight, that the public hearing not be closed and that the public hearing be continued to the July 11th city council meeting where public comment will continue and council decision on the project will be made. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone understands anyone wishing to speak on this item may do so only once, either tonight or at the July 11th city council meeting with the exception of the applicant as is our normal due process um, proce uh, practice of providing both opening comment and rebuttal comment. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce the applicant uh, representative, Tom Cohen, and the architect, Keith McCloskey, for your presentation. Please come down to the podium. You have 15 minutes, and you'll have five minutes to rebuttal. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and council members. My name is Tom Cohen. I'm a resident here of Thousand Oaks. Here on behalf of Latigo Hillcrest LLC, the applicant. Uh, tonight uh, with us is Mark Marin, co-founder of the Latigo Group, representing his partner, Scott, Nick, and the dedicated Latigo team. Uh, as I'm sure you all uh, know, Mark and his team uh, delivered big time with the Santal Thousand Oaks mix Mixed Use Project uh, at 299 Thousand Oaks Boulevard, which opened at the beginning of the year. You can rest assured that Latigo will match 299's excellence at the uh, 2150 Hillcrest property. Uh, also in attendance uh, in person and maybe via Zoom, uh, Keith McCloskey with KTG Architects is here, Fred Cunningham, uh, civil engineer with Stantec, Richard Ibarra, the project arborist, John Moreland with Rencon, he's the author of the specific plan, Diane McKay is here, CEO of Mustang Marketing. I'm gonna keep my remarks brief and then Keith, uh, Keith will present uh, key project specifics that we'd like to share with you. Uh, the balance of the team is here to respond to any questions that Keith or I cannot answer. First uh, and foremost, we need to thank staff, in particular uh, attention on Justine for, ex uh, for her excellent expert guidance uh, through this planning process. Uh, the enormity of this project required Justine's keen insight and management. I'd also like to congratulate Justine for being uh, honored in the 40 under 40 by the, uh, the chamber. I think that's a terrific uh, recognition. Uh, we also sincerely appreciate staff's and the Planning Commission's recommendation to approve the project. Uh, we believe this project warrants your support tonight. Uh, I'm not going to rehash anything that Justine uh, stated in the staff report presentation that was very thorough. Uh, a key attribute of this project is its location, directly across from the Amgen campus in the Rancho Canal Industrial Park. As such, being an important gateway location to a major source of jobs, it was vitally important to Amgen, to Latigo, and the city that we deliver a high-quality, well-designed project with a wide range of amenities for the future residents. We believe what is before you tonight meets and exceeds all expectations for a gateway project. You know better than I do that housing is in short supply and is desperately needed. And this project is going to deliver 333 uh, units and could not be better located considering its proximity to jobs in the industrial park in Amgen, as I stated earlier. And the city council had the foresight uh, a couple of years ago by identifying this site as a key location for housing when it adopted this preferred land use map in May of 2021. Let's touch on uh, some of the project's public benefits. 30 very low and three moderate income apartments, 10% of the project. It will be provided, which helps chip away at the city's arena numbers. And we're providing five more affordable units that the state density bonus law requires. Uh, sustainability measures, you heard earlier um, that we're electrifying all the apartments. Uh, there's more EV charging st systems and EV ready infrastructure provided than required by Cal Green. And you heard about the electric bicycle and scooter charging stations that are gonna be provided. This project's gonna remove from our office stock an old vacant office building and replace it with a vibrant new mixed use residential community and enliven that area. And because of the project's proximity to Amgen and other nearby businesses, the future residents will have the opportunity to walk or bike to work, thereby uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled on our streets. 
Uh, we're anticipating high quality restaurants. Uh, you'll note uh, that Latico's incredible success in landing three uh, in restaurants at 299 bodes well for what will happen here at 2150. Uh, and then lastly, the project uh, will be improving the gateway entry with the uh, enhanced landscaping and walking path along Rancho Canal, along with a new gateway sign that we will uh, uh, work with staff to uh, design and produce. This project checks all the boxes. It provides housing in close proximity to jobs, where retail exists and where services are nearby. In addition, we're incorporating sustainability measures that will encourage walking instead of driving. It's gonna uh, encourage community engagement by providing uh, retail, restaurants, and other commercial uses within the housing project. The project will encourage the community to support local businesses and provide our local businesses a place for their employees to live. The re common refrain you all uh, have been hearing for the last several years is the clamoring of the life sciences and biotech community expressing a desire for contemporary housing options for the next generation of workers. So this project fits that to a T. Uh, please know that outreach was conducted by uh, Diane McKay's team. While there's been some of the typical chatter on social media, uh, we have not received any direct opposition to the project. Uh, last thing I wanna mention uh, is we've reviewed all 279 of the project conditions and uh, have agreed to each and every one of those. Uh, in closing, I'd like to state that Latigo has a proven track record right here in Thousand Oaks of building impressive and much needed housing with great amenities for both its future residents and the community at large. As with 299, which magnificently transformed an obsolete property, Latigo will do it again. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, I'm gonna turn it now over to Keith uh, with KTGY. Uh, Patrick already answered one of the questions that I heard from the, from the dais, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, let, let that go for now, but we'll, we will be available to answer any questions you have. Great, good evening, Mayor McNamee and City Council members. Uh, my name is Keith McCloskey of KTGY, and um, I'd like to just walk through briefly a few of the design details that haven't been covered tonight and we can um, hopefully move through those uh, and give a little bit more insight into some of the background on that design. So on the site plan, uh, some of the things that have been referred to tonight talk about the idea of creating this mixed-use village um, and kind of uh, place for um, the entire community, as well as Amgen employees and other folks, um, to come and congregate in, in this mixed-use place. And the key corners of the project on the northwest and northeast corners are gonna be anchored by either uh, public lobbies or um, mixed-use uh, commercial and dining establishments. And then once in t inside the uh, core of the project, um, the corner of the uh, commercial building uh, where the restaurant and um, retail spaces will be, will front onto Hillcrest. Um, that berm that exists today will remain and be enhanced with additional landscaping um, to beautify uh, the frontage along Hillcrest. And then there's still uh, housing along uh, the remainder of that frontage. So we'll have um, access to uh, ground floor living units uh, with patios. Um, and the architecture throughout will contain a variety of uh, layering, massing breaks, uh, and material transitions uh, throughout the entirety of the project. Um, some views here through the heart of the campus as you move into it. Um, the idea of this mixed-use village is really um, anchored by the central street as well, even uh, once passing the commercial components of the project. The internal heart of the campus is really set up to be um, more like a resort type arrival sequence where you've got uh, a key focal building in the form of the um, uh, leasing building as kind of the main arrival point uh, in the heart of that campus on that road. And all of the uh, parking is pushed subterranean uh, in both of these buildings, either behind retail or underground in a way that it's concealed and we let the architecture come forward and and really become kind of the elements that welcome folks into the community. 
Uh, this leasing building will kind of be the gateway into the heart of the larger residential portion of the building and internal to that, uh, once inside the um, uh, private courtyards of the residential components, um, we'll have a variety of uh, amenity spaces, including uh, the pool deck, um, barbecue areas, um, residential gardens, et cetera. So the whole project is really set up in a way to be a series of layered buildings um, that interconnect and create unique moments of outdoor open space, um, as well as um, kind of very diverse set of uh, indoor amenity programs. Um, as was discussed earlier, there's gonna be a robust program in terms of um, sustainability, in terms of the materiality, the energy uh, consumption, um, on-site generation of uh, uh, power with a, a solar farm, as well as the additional EV that's being provided. And then in the back of the project, one of the main components of the site design is really the detention basin, and that detention basin is also doubling as uh, an amenity outdoor uh, walking pads and things for the residents. Um, the idea of the green spaces in this project are really to create a, a green wrapper or band around the uh, project that kind of uh, buffers it from uh, all the perimeters and the edges here. Um, and this gives you an idea of what the project will look like from the freeway. But again, always stepping down, kind of creating layered uh, building massings, um, stepping out towards the edges and um, reducing the height around the perimeter. Um, um, all of the uh, materials around every side of the building create kind of a dynamic uh, collage of plaster, uh, brick, uh, wood look fiber cement, and uh, metal accents and awnings um, to give some articulation to the project. Um, so we're here to answer any other questions that you guys may have about the design, um, the project Thank itself. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go to, before we go to public comment, I'm going to go to council questions. And uh, because I moved right to left before, I'm going to move left to right. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for your presentation. A couple of questions on the sustainability front. Uh, Mr. Cohen had testified that uh, the design is electrifying all the apartments. And I'd like to just clarify what's meant by that. Are we, are we saying these are 100% these are electric, so no gas? Yeah, that's what um, Mr. Cohen was suggesting, was that we're proposing an all-electric residential building here. So all the residential units would be only supplied electricity, but no gas power. Um, the only exception to that being the commercial, um, having sure. the sure, provision sure. for gas cooking there. Yeah, this is similar with the TO Ranch, where I think that the residential units are all electric, but yep. I think because one of the retail uses was restaurant, the, there was gas there. Okay. Um, similarly, are you also on the sustainability front? Um, what use, if any, are you making of solar power and or battery backup storage? Yeah, so the new code actually requires the battery backup. And so I think due to the large amount of the EV charging that's going to be done here, the battery is kind of critical. Um, and it is going to require multiple battery rooms throughout the subterranean garage to basically get it in the right zones of the building and to be able to feed some of those um, charging stations. Uh, as Mr. Heher mentioned, there's about 57 installed day one. And, and that's kind of a commitment from day one, but I think the vision is that once the demand increases, that the building would be able to build in the infrastructure that could be scalable and be able to accommodate future growth in terms of the electric charging as well. Sure, and how are those on-site batteries fed? Are they are from on-site solar? From on-site solar, yeah. Very good, okay. And then, and then my final question in the sustainability area is um, whether the design, um, there's still a fair amount of pavement here. Um, does it make use of permeable substances? Is there any sort of system to capture groundwater runoff for, for reuse on site? Yeah, there is. I mean, we have the driveways throughout and for the surface parking areas. The idea being that we have that balance of the structured parking that's subterranean as well as convenience parking um, in and around the retail and some of the public areas. Um, 
and acting as a buffer on the west, but at some of the parking spaces on the west as well as on that central drive, uh, we have the um, conversion of um, asphalt into permeable paving to basically reduce the amount of total impervious surface for the project. Yeah, so the less runoff, the better. Then my final question, and, and maybe this is for Mr. Cohen or the applicant, um, um, has to do with the 33 affordable units. Um, I think it's terrific that we're adding to our affordable stock. Uh, good job. Um, I'm just wondering if you can walk me through the thought process at arriving of the at the split of 30 very low income and three um, moderate income. Why, why that split? Why um, why not some other division among the yeah. different affordable so, categories? Yeah, I'll have them join as well if there's something I can't answer. But with respect to the affordable units, you know, when we looked at um, this project during the pre-screen with Amgen and we had the project um, approved at that time, the, the process came about with providing the um, necessary affordable units for the density bonus to get right. to the 333. And that's 28 very low income units. And then in discussion with um, staff with respect to um, some of the unique features of our project and our specific plan and trying to bring as much affordable housing to the project as possible, um, through those discussions on the development agreement, the Latigo group voluntarily added the additional units. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I'm actually asking a slightly different question. Um, this non-lawyer's understanding of the density bonus law from the state is that it allows a 30, up to 35% in this case density bonus if affordable units, I believe, of any affordable category, so very low, low, or moderate, are added. And my question is, in this case, how did we arrive at the particular mix of 30 very low and three moderate? Yeah, um, given that they were voluntary, they didn't necessarily correspond to the math. So when the additional two units for very low and the three for moderate came into play, um, there, there wasn't a calculation based on trying to push bonus in a certain um, direction by I, providing a certain I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm asking again a different question. Why, why, let's say, 30 very low and not 15 very low and 15 low and three moderate? Why the particular 30 plus three split is the question I'm asking. And I'm not putting a value judgment on it. I think it's very good of any kind. We need all these. I'm just wondering about why this particular split. Well, I think the the short answer is under the state density bonus law does not address uh, providing a, a percentage of one income category and another income category. So if I wanted to somehow uh, build up to a 35% density bonus by mixing income categories, the, 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 the law does not provide for that. And I've actually had conversations with uh, HCD about it, and it's really a, uh, a call by the local jurisdiction as to what they want to see. And so, uh, for, for our purposes, uh, we want we 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 followed the straight line of the state density bonus law, and we saw that very low income was a uh, uh, it's a needed category, and uh, we went above and beyond. That's really how this came about. All right, thank you. Nothing more. Mr. Taylor. Uh, I'm going to start by stating a little bit of the obvious. Uh, before I got here, council asked investors to build projects that didn't impact our residential neighborhoods. Uh, you guys picked a distressed asset that was commercial, turned it into an asset of need, and this is something that Amgen has been asking for. So I, I think just great job on that regard. My first question, how is the debt market Kind of what's going on with insurance and just the rise of expenses impacted your project? Yeah, I'll let Mark speak to that. Thanks, thanks, Keith, and uh, again, thanks to Council for having us tonight, and a special thank you to the planning staff. Second time around that we've worked with them, and you know, I know that was mentioned it might be a difficult process. They've made it much less difficult. So thank you, Justine, for. Um, your guidance and efforts here, and they're duly noted. Um, <clears throat> so I think your question, um, 
uh, just to make it clear, just if you wouldn't mind just repeating it and, and I'll. Yeah, with what's going on with the debt market, pullback and rise of interest rates, what's going on with insurance, just an overall increase of expenses and considering that a lot of that happened after you guys put this under contract, how has that impacted your, your deal or your project? You know, look, there's, we, we read every day, just given the federal rate hikes, um, the difficulties we face both as consumers and, and as business folks with inflation. There's no question this project is more expensive than our project at 299. That being said, we are not sacrificing anything in the way of quality materials. And quite frankly, you know, the debt markets where we to go and see capital, the debt's expensive, the bigger issue is the equity. And for a project of this size, you've got to capitalize it with institutional equity. We simply cannot, you know, Latigo has a good investor base. It's not deep enough to provide the equity uh, for a project of this sort. Now we do raise institutional funds with our other projects. Um, and, you know, the demands today, um, it's all based on, you know, you probably know this, Mikey, which is yield on cost, mm -hmm. right? And the market today wants a six and a half yield on cost. This project basic right now is barely over five. When we did Santal, um, we were slightly above five, maybe 15 basis points higher, 5.2 versus call it 5.03 you know, or 04, which is where we are today. But interest rates were at 3%. The 10 year was at 3% and cap rates were at four, maybe even lower for a project in Thousand Oaks. So the equity market's looking and saying, look, you know, if you're able to only get a five yield on a project um, and cap rates are at five today, there's no what they call positive leverage. So to answer your question, um, it's challenging, um, but we have 12 months before we put shovels in the ground. And our hope is that the Fed's fight is going to be fruitful as it relates to uh, bringing inflation down. We have seen some improvement in construction pricing um, from where we were even you know, a year ago, um, which compares to most of our projects are actually in Florida. We've seen no reduction right. um, in costs there, but fortunately here, we are seeing some, which gives us hope that we'll be able to get that yield on cost number up. Um, and at the same time, we hope that by the time we put shuffles in the ground, rates will, um, you know, will come down a bit and that the market focus will no longer be a, you know, six and a half yield on cost, but we'll move south of that um, where everything will align. You know, we're, we're hopeful about that, but there's no question that, and as you probably know, there are a lot of, of, of deals right now that are basically being, you know, put on hold. Uh, we see it um, not just in California, but we also see it in Florida because insurance, as you mentioned, was the last nail in the coffin. It was one thing to see high construction costs, um, historically high construction costs. Um, we've seen lumber abate a little bit, but very, very high construction costs, then rates doubled. Um, so if you think about a construction loan where we were paying 5%, you know, it's closer to, to nine today um, to finance a project. And then the last piece of it was, and you know, we're no strangers in California to high, high cost insurance. So we're seeing it both in the cost of what we call builder's liability insurance, i.e. building the project and having liability insurance. And then once we've actually built it um, and residents are there, we of course have the ongoing, um, and in each case, Rates have, you know, between the two have gone anywhere from doubling to, you know, three or four times, um, something we contend with. Because at the other end of it, we've got to build something that is attractive to consumers here. We can't just keep assuming that just because we've got higher costs, we're going to pass that on to the, to the consumer. We've seen that with our own project at 299. Um, I think, you know, um, we're seeing where rents have kind of leveled off, so we, I think we have a ceiling, and, and that is a TO Boulevard location. Right. This location is not on the boulevard, and so we're trying to be mindful of that. Okay, so for anyone listening who isn't in our world, doesn't know cap rates and yield on cost, basically it's become more expensive to build, and so you're watching returns come down, correct? That's correct. Okay. But in the meantime, we'll move forward with plans. Okay, and then you just mentioned something that I was gonna ask you about, which was developer cycles. Can you talk about what developers typically do in moments like this, or even when it gets worse in an economic downturn, what do we normally see when it comes to building? Do we see more or do we see less? Less. So then my final kind of highlight in this, and really where I'm going, a lot of times we really focus on just the affordable, the affordable housing part of building, uh, and we forget that they go hand in hand with supply. Supply is incredibly important for us to kind of get to a market that makes sense again. So 
what I want to say and, and, and what I think is a, a good, uh, what would be the right word, where I'm happy you guys are moving forward on is it's very difficult to build right now. You're watching a lot of builders not build, and you guys are bringing much needed supply online, which ultimately helps us get to our goal, which is having an area that is and has affordable housing for our residents. So thank you for that. Our pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Engler. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think um, we do focus on affordable housing and uh, the fact that you have uh, not only met the minimum on affordable housing, we have thrown in a few extra is great, uh, but housing is housing. Uh, the market rate housing will also help us. And uh, that's part of our overall strategy to bring more uh, doors for people to have here in Thousand Oaks. So uh, we appreciate everybody who is, is working with us on that. Um, I just had a couple of real quick questions. I think most of my uh, um, sustainability questions were already answered, uh, thanks to my colleague, uh, Mr. Newman. But the, um, uh, I think I remember in the, in the uh, development agreement, we're talking about some uh, shared workspace that's gonna be available for, for the residents, and also some live work units. Is that uh, part of what we're doing there? Which will help us with our, our uh, vehicle miles traveled, um, you know, equation as well. So I think that's, you know, I'm looking at uh, my little box checks thing here and uh, uh, between what um, uh, Mr. Newman has brought forward and uh, what you've brought forward, Mr. Uh, Taylor, I think um, things are uh, uh, looking good right now. So we'll see. Couple questions. What about you? I go last. May, Mr. Adam, go ahead. I didn't know you, actually, I didn't know you wanted to make a comment, so for ask That's a question. That's okay, Mayor, I forgive you. Um, hello, anyway, uh, let's hope the Federal Reserve, this pause they are with rate increases, maybe becomes permanent, we'll have to see. And maybe uh, I, I live for the day when I get a Federal Reserve announcement that we're going to lower rates. Be very nice. First quarter, second quarter next year, maybe. Who knows? All depends on the economy. But you know, you mentioned an interesting thing about um, 299 and having a good location on Teal Boulevard. I totally agree with you. It's a great location. I, I think you got a pretty good location here as well. Um, I, I'm sure you know that we've put a lot of emphasis on the bioscience hub. Amgen, of course, has been around forever, but there's a lot of other companies blossoming over there, Captiva, Atara, Fuji, and um, I think that this project has a real opportunity to be, to be successful and enhance our bioscience hub at the same time. And I, do me a favor, if you will. <laughs> I, I've talked to people at Alexandria, and I've talked to uh, bio, um, Westlake Biopartners, you're very familiar with the, the culture of bioscience kids, because when I went over the VIT, they're all in their 20s and 30s. They, they need a place to gather. They, unlike tech people, which seem, tend to be uh, um, uh, very secretive, bioscience people seemingly like to collaborate and, and talk about things, and that helps with growth. So. Do you think you could provide that with, with the commercial area? I know you got about 5,000 square feet. I mean, I'd love to see your, your project be the place that these kids want to go at 5 o'clock on a Friday to, you know, change, exchange ideas, and who knows what can come of it. And I, I think that's a big opportunity there for you. Uh, Al, we agree with you. Um, you know, at 299, hopefully you can hear, at 299. Go to the other one. Here, I'll go to this one. There you go. Um, you know, at 299, there were folks that said, what are you gonna do with 11,000 square feet in a world where retail is not exactly vibrant, right? But what we did know, and having spent a lot of time in Thousand Oaks, you know, Scott and I and the rest of the team felt the city was under restauranted. So luckily for us, we were able to get the folks at Joy, Basta, Go Fish, Sushi, and See Me to come, and then the last lease is a, uh, is a Pilates studio, actually. So we're completely leased as far as that 11,000 square feet. As it relates to the Hillcrest project, we actually had a focus group session over at Amgen. They invited us over and we spent some time with them trying to understand exactly what you're, what, what you're getting at. And there's no question that they want a watering hole. 
Um, yes. I mean, yes. food. <laughs> al- I, I won't. I won't. I won't review the order in which they were discussed. But let's just say that um, a wa- watering hole and good food is something that's clearly on the agenda. So I'd like to think that based on what we've done at 299, um, we'll have a lot of interest um, given that location, given that it sits at the gateway to um, a life science center that has 25 plus companies that are arrayed around Amgen. Uh, so you know, we 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 do think it'll be. Um, uh, ex- extremely attractive, you know, for um, restaurant folks. Uh, don't not know exactly whether it's going to be one, two, um, but we will aim for variety. We'll aim for something that we think the community really, really wants, aside from um, some great cocktails. I'm very glad to hear that. You never know what might come of a shared drink on a Friday afternoon, you know? Next thing you know, you got another startup going. Who knows? You know, we were we were reminded by the Amgen folks that, um, and I think Fred, you would you 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 were you know around then that many years ago Fridays were extremely important yeah. uh, to Amgen folks as to where they want to gather. So they um, they'd like to see uh, something approaching that. So you know we're we're well aware of it. And I think with the amount of space that we have, it's very very manageable. Very glad to hear that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a few questions. One again, as a, an instructor at a community college here in. Ventura County and a son of a college professor, university professor. Education is paramount in my mind's eye to shape lives for the better, reduce crime, reduce the prison population, and provide people purpose in life so they can afford to have a roof over their head and food on the table. The previous projects here in the city at, uh, developed by IMT with the Kmart site, as well as Kennedy Wilson developing the Baxter site, they value education as well and they have decided to put in a tutoring center where not only the residents that live in that apartment complex, but those in the area can use that as a safe place to meet up with tutors to help the students there struggling with their education. Is there a consideration here in this plan to also provide a tutoring center in this facility to assist in the educational opportunities here in the city? Yeah, just like those projects, this project has contemplated that as kind of being a critical portion of the program. And the front building, Building A, that fronts along Hillcrest has the uh, watering hole restaurant space on the northwest corner, closer to the gas station. And then on the east side, the quieter residential side, we've got our residential lobby there coming kind of directly you know, across the street from the uh, Amgen campus. That corner that's there immediately adjacent to the lobby we have an interior space that's for meeting areas, um, tutoring room, a co-working space for residents, all kind of collective there so that it looks and feels like a public uh, commercial corner, um, even though residents can use it as well. But it's meant to serve both residents and the community. Excellent, because I could see the uh, intellectual capital there at Amgen moonlighting after work to help tutor some of the students across the street and in the neighborhood, and that would be a tremendous value. Where else could you find a rocket scientist to help tutor you? Uh, next, I, you mentioned a reten- retention basin, and one of the models that is being used in other parts of the country is that those open spaces in apartment complexes being used for agriculture, so people can grow their own fruits and vegetables, or a restaurant there grow the fruits and vegetables to be used in their restaurants on the location where people can go down and pick a head of lettuce or carrot or tomato and have a wonderful salad. Is it possible to consider that as an amenity that the community may want to do or even some of the restaurants that are here to grow the food that they're using in the restaurants? Yeah, we have plenty of space kind of throughout the residential campus to do that. I think at that basin location due to the temporary flooding nature of that, that's kind of a passive space that's really just set aside as walking trails, but we also have a lot of open space set aside kind of up in the front of the commercial, adjacent to the public seating, that some of that could potentially be used as a community garden space. And then for residents um, on the back building, building B up on podium, uh, we have a lot of uh, meandering gardens and kind of linear paseo spaces that could use some of that space as a community garden as well. Not a, not a make or break for me with this project, just a suggestion as an, an additional amenity to a beautiful project you have developed so far. Last one is that, as Council Member Taylor and you articulated, is that the cost of construction has gone up, and that's going to result in higher uh, housing costs for those that want to live in the community. And those 
complaints I hear, and it's a valid one, is that it costs a lot to live in California, specifically Thousand Oaks, and that housing is not affordable. Yes, the interest rate's going up, the debt service, in insurance, building, construction materials has all gone up. That gets passed through, ultimately, to the renter. My concern is that you are five units above for moderate income and low income than what the state mandates. Every time we put in a low income, very low income, that's basically zero dollars to give return to the investors that would like to have a rate of return because if they don't make a profit on their investments, there's no reason to come build in Thousand Oaks or in California. My question, and I'm kind of confused here, is to why are you adding five more units of low income and moderate income, which again reduces the amount of revenue for your return on the investment, which in turn is gonna drive up the costs for those others market rate that are paying more money now because you introduce five additional units. Is that something you, out of the courtesy and the charity of your heart said, okay, let's put in five additional units so we can drive up the price for everybody else? Was it one that the city asked us to do uh, on behalf of the low income folks, why did you voluntarily put in five units that's gonna drive up the cost for everybody else? Yeah, I'll let uh, the rest of the team chime in as well, but I think with respect to the affordability, I think the market side of things are gonna really cap at what the market is willing to pay, and I, I think that really where it, it comes down to is kind of those margins that M Mark was talking about earlier with respect to the uh, return on cost. So if you wanna speak to that in any degree. I'll, I'll help answer that. Yeah, I mean, it, this is like like everything uh, in life. It's we had to look at um, you know how much uh, community benefit can this project bring to the city, and so in our discussions with staff, uh, you know, and looking at some of the things that the project needed, things that the city needs, and we know uh, meeting your arena requirement is a big deal. Uh, it it was a negotiation. Let's just be clear. So, when I hear that word community benefit, that is weaponizing government, in my opinion, to extort money out of developers and other individuals. Because if you want to move forward with this project, unless you do X, that's going to drive up the cost of the project, you can't move forward. Therefore, you're basically saying, provide these additional units, otherwise you can't build. And yes, it's part of the negotiation, but community benefit to me is nothing short of legal extortion. And some will contend that no, extortion is whole something different, but from what I'm hearing, you did not have to voluntarily do those five units out of the generosity of your heart and drive up the cost for others. It was a requirement of the city. Is that a fair statement it's in negotiation? A, it's a calculation that the, the the development team, the property owner, our client uh, had to make. Sure. And, and that's why uh, we made it. I, I understand. So in other words, you got to do that or it's not moving forward and staff is saying you got to do that. And that's my words, not yours. You're very diplomatic. I'm not. I'm going to be straightforward with everybody. So uh, city manager, I'm sure, is going to jump in here and comment on this. Mayor, may I borrow? What I, I I just wanted. I, I reserve the right to respond later. Yeah, I just want to make clear, based on the dialogue, um, yeah, these negotiations happen on all development agreements, and they're consistent with council's adopted priorities. And so, the focus uh, one of council's top priorities is affordable housing. Council has also been on the record as focused on a, a ten percent number uh, as it relates to. Uh, your inclusionary housing, which is not adopted yet, but it provides at least a baseline of where the council as a whole is focused. And so that serves as a parameter. It's not staff making uh, determinations. These are all based on council's um, uh, spoken priorities. So we're gonna go over to public comment. First up on Zoom, we have Amelia Brownlee Fuentes, and after that will be Faith Grant. Given the uh, six speakers that we have, that's four minutes each. I'll let you know at 15 minutes, or 15 seconds, I'll very quietly say you've got 15 so you conclude your comment. So Jackson Piper, you've got, uh, Madam Clerk, can we move it to four minutes, please? Right. Mr. Piper, go ahead. 
Uh, I'm sorry, is, uh, am I first or is Amelia no, Brownlee? Uh, no, you're first, sir, and um, go okay. ahead and uh, speak. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jackson Piper. I'm a resident of unincorporated Newbury Park. Um, I've been here for over 30 years. I'm also one of the leads for Ventura County Yimby and um, involved in Thousand Oaks Livability Action Network as well. Um, I'm here to ask the council to um, move this project forward. Uh, I think, you know, it's not, no project is gonna be perfect, but this one is pretty darn close. Um, it cites, uh, you know, 333 units of housing within easy walking distance to um, most of the Amgen campus. I did a calculation uh, on Google Earth with the, the measurement tool and most of it should be within 50, not 50, uh, half a mile of uh, walking distance from the front to the, the buildings on the campus. So um, I really appreciate that the uh, the developer is providing not only the um, baseline amount of uh, affordable units to generate a density bonus, but is also going beyond that um, and sees value in providing that community benefit. I think the truth is Thousand Oaks is so far behind uh, in terms of delivering on affordable housing for the residents that need it. Um, every single unit we can get is a community benefit and we, we need we need thousands more of them, but the reality is we have to get as many as possible with each project. So I think the um, developer is really, really going out of their way to do us a favor here. And I do appreciate that. Um, I also think that part of sustainability, um, you know, I'm trained as an urban planner. Um, you can't just look at the site, you have to look at the site, the project site in context of, you know, what's around it um, outside of the site. Um, having this place be within walking distance of Amgen means that theoretically, if the residents are mostly Amgen employees or other employees at um, industrial uses nearby, those are cars off the road. Um, these people could pretty easily walk to um, Amgen and to some of the other businesses for that trip that otherwise would have to be a commute by car. So that's a very important sustainability element that I think often gets overlooked. Um, I think that this is a very thoughtfully designed project, um, and I really think Thousand Oaks needs a lot more of it, uh, more projects like this. So I'm happy to see this uh, um, presented here today, and I really hope that the City Council uh, moves it all forward. Thank you. Amelia Brownlee Fuentes, you're next on Zoom, and then followed by Faith Grant. Please proceed, Amelia. Good evening, my name is Amalia Boli Fuentes and I'm from the law firm Lozo Drury and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility or SAFER. SAFER is requesting that the City Council prepare a revised final environmental impact report for this project which incorporates all feasible mitigation measures to reduce the project's environmental impacts. CEQA requires that public agencies avoid or reduce environmental impacts whenever feasible by requiring environmentally superior alternatives and feasible mitigation measures. Here, Caltrans recommended a number of mitigation measures aimed at reducing the project's vehicle miles traveled, transportation access, and pedestrian bicyclist safety. In response, the city noted that the project's VMT impact was less than significant, but did not explain why the suggested measures to reduce parking spaces and provide class four bike lanes and improved transit centers are infeasible. For this reason, SAFER respectfully requests that the City Council continue consideration of the FEIR for this project until these issues have been addressed. Thank you. Next up, we have Faith Grant, and after Faith Grant in-house, we have Danielle Borgia. Danielle, please come down and have a seat, uh, and you'll be on after Faith Grant. Faith, go ahead and proceed. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Faith Grant, and I live in Thousand Oaks, and I'm a member of Caneo Climate Coalition. Uh, I want to say thank you to Mr. Cohen and Mr. McCloskey for providing a lot more details on this project. Uh, it was missing in the agenda packet. Since buildings and transportation make up the majority of greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming in Thousand Oaks, Caneo Climate Coalition is requesting that the city keep the environment in mind when evaluating this project. Regarding building greenhouse gases, all electric construction is an accelerating statewide trend that addresses the urgent need 
to transition quickly away from polluting and dangerous fossil fuel connections to safer, healthier, more affordable living choices for residents and workers of all new building developments. We support projects that are all electric. With regard to parking spaces, we're pleased that they will be EV ready. With California going all electric by 2035, charging stations will be a requirement for the majority of tenants. Other sustainable building features of an all electric infrastructure, such as solar panels and batteries, heat pumps, cool roofs, and more are critical. We support these sustainable features in this development. Our environment is out of balance and we have an opportunity at our city level to reduce greenhouse gases and new building projects and to bring our environment back in balance. Thank you for including these sustainable building features in this project. Next we have up Danielle Borgia after Daniela is Danielle is uh, Sean Meridian. Mayor McNamee, I would like to postpone our comments to July 11th. Thank you. Excellent. Sean Meridian, you're up next. And then after that, Jonathan Duran. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor McNamee, Council members, my name is Sean Meridian, lifelong resident of Thousand Oaks, and here on behalf of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association with strong support for this project before you this evening. Um, we met the applicant years ago when they had proposed their project at 299. At that time, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of promises. And through the years, they have delivered on every single one of their commitments, and they delivered a project that has not only been widely received, highly successful, you heard uh, the numbers that are practically indisputable, fully leased, but it's created an incredible catalyst around that project. Um, <clears throat> for the other property owners, for the other businesses. And I know firsthand several small business owners and employers that are actually living at 299 now that are able to walk to work. Why that's relevant uh, is because I think the western part of our city doesn't have anything like that. And what's unique about this project, unlike the other ones, where this was an employer that brought this project forward. I want to remind everybody that. Amgen saw a need that they have been requesting for over a decade to us. We need more housing for our employers. They saw that it wasn't able to be delivered fast enough. Therefore, they took a piece of their parcel on their campus, didn't put up for sale. They went and they went through the pre-screen process because they wanted to ensure that what happens on their parcel will meet the needs of their employment base, their community. They got it approved and then they went out and they sought a partner. They didn't seem to sell it to the highest bidder. I was aware of several interested parties that wanted to purchase this property, but they chose this group because of their track record, because of their quality project, and because of their deliverables. And that's why this applicant won the site. It's long overdue. I believe that this project has tremendous amount of merit. These folks have demonstrated that they're gonna deliver a first-class project. They're gonna do it right. They've already discussed with Toba how they can activate some of their commercial spaces and, and get our support. So we strongly support it and we ask that you move it forward. Thank you. Next up, we have Jonathan Duran. Jonathan, you're on. Hello, Mayor, city staff, uh, council members. Uh, name is Jonathan Duran. I'm a resident of Newberry Park. Uh, I am also a representative with the Southwest Mountain States Regional Council of Carpenters, uh, Local 805, so it encompasses Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo County, so the Tri-Counties. Um, again, my kids go to school here. My kids go to Sequoia. My daughter's gonna be going to Banyan next year, so it's gonna be great to have those opportunities for my children to be able to grow up in this community. But having that opportunity to be able to have my children grow up in this community is also to look at the long-term goal of, hey, opportunities for them to live in this community project itself, it is a great project. I'm not saying, hey, we need housing. Housing is what we need in, here in Thousand Oaks. It's the affordability aspect. But at the same time, we also have to think about the individuals gonna be building those projects. Most of the construction workers that are gonna be building these projects cannot afford to live within this community. Most of the individuals that have come in, they drive out from outside the area from San Fernando Valley, 
uh, San Bernardino and further to come work here because that's the opportunities. But I, I'm asking the city council in, is to look at opportunities for having a uh, skilled and trained workforce, um, some kind of element to be able to uh, use um, accredited apprenticeship program and have people within the community itself work within the city. And yes, have partnership with these developers. And that's what we want is have, hey, let's come together, find common ground. Hey, let's work together to be able to build these projects. Because guess what? I worked at Amgen. I worked on a lot of the projects there. And the great, great, uh, uh, through my career, it was a great opportunity. And a lot of my tradesmen and women within the industry had found that as well. Some of the other projects that are gonna be coming down the pipeline, coming up the way of the Rancho Conejo is all those tilt-ups gonna be happening. Takeda is gonna be doing another real big uh, build out out there. And yes, aspect of the environmental impact. Yes, there's gonna be more traffic going up into that corridor. And yes, having individuals be able to live at this development, to be able to work in those areas, that is great. But again, at what cost? What is the cost gonna be for us? Yes, affordability, what is affordable in California? What is affordable in Ventura County? And what is affordable in Thousand Oaks? I'm lucky enough to be able to, I had purchased a home about 12 years ago. I live here and it's great. And I'm happy to be here. I'm, long, I'm a long life resident of Ventura County. I was born in Santa Paula, youngest of five, got into the trade and went through the ranks and had an opportunity to purchase a house here. But that was all because of me being a part of a, a union. I'm having an opportunity to have a job, good benefits, and to be able to provide for my family. Those are things that I look at. And when I hear developers saying, hey, we are giving this to the, to the community, you're not giving anything. We want something to be able to have for our children to be able to come back and go, hey, I want my son, my daughter, to be, to be able to live close to me. Not, hey, guess what, Dad? I'm going to be moving out of the state because I can't afford to live here anymore. So what we want to make sure is, hey, we're here to be able to work together with any developers that do come into Thousand Oaks or into the Ganeo Valley. Hey, come talk to us. Have an opportunity to speak with us and uh, be able to work with each other. Thank you for your time. Given that uh, we're gonna continue this to the July 11th meeting, I need a motion from council to move to July 11th. Who would like to step forward? I'd be happy to uh, make that a motion. Excellent, Madam Clerk. Council Member Angler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Council Member, excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Excellent, we'll move to uh, number 10, department reports, uh, Mr. Tim, Giles of uh, Human Resource Director, Benefits and Compensations for Executive Managers. Uh, Mr. Giles, I guess I'll start, you're on. start here. What? Let's, let's, oh. I'll, I'll present from here, uh, Mayor, members of the Council. Um, on this item, um, the earlier this evening, you approved memorandum of understanding with our represented uh, bargaining units uh, for our employees. The executive uh, managers are not represented, and so uh, they are, are before you in a separate action. Pursuant to state law, executive compensation, what the other employees uh, uh, received in the MOUs that, that, we were, that were approved earlier this evening, they generally track the changes that the senior managers uh, received. Um, and both with, return, with regard to uh, salary and merit-based adjustments, the cafeteria plan adjustments, uh, the holiday uh, adjustments, and the dental plan adjustments. And again, executive managers are on a merit pay uh, system. And uh, what is before you uh, for recommended approval is a, is a real resolution um, amending the benefits and compensation for executive managers. And we would also recommend that you find the action is not a project as defined under CEQA. Available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, no speakers here. Council, any questions for Mr. Giles? Uh, can I entertain a motion? Who wants to move forward with a motion? Move 10A. 10A, including the CEQA? Exempt from CEQA. That's part two. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Angler. 
Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. And let's uh, have City Manager, Mr. Powers, you have the floor. Thanks, Mayor McNamee. Uh, we'll be uh, back on the 11th of July. Um, at that time, we uh, will have the uh, number fourth hearing on the uh, district elections map. Um, that'll be the evening based on our timeline that we've outlined that the council um, will, uh, will need to make a selection uh, to move forward with second reading on the 18th of July. Um, the um, hearing that we just completed uh, will be continued um, and we will have a study session on the draft general plan. Um, those are the items that are set forth for the meeting on the 11th uh, of uh, July. Um, I also wanted to take a quick moment to remind everyone that the draft general plan uh, 2045 has been released. Uh, it's available for public review and comment through mid-September. Uh, TOKES2045.org is your website uh, for it. And we have a general plan advisory committee meeting um, on Wednesday the 28th at City Hall. And we have a public workshop on the draft general plan uh, on Thursday, June 29th at the Los Robles Greens Golf Course. Um, you can find those dates and more information at toaks2045.org. That is it. Thank you, sir. Until July 11th, this meeting is adjourned.